Uh, this is, uh, in fact, our uh, fourth session, uh, day two of uh, our conference, uh, that is the flagship uh, 13th uh, MPIDSA South Asia conference on uh, this time on the return of the Taliban in Afghanistan implications and the way forward. And uh, uh, each session has actually turned out to be uh, as interesting as the uh, previous one. And this uh, session, the fourth one, obviously promises to be no less, uh, particularly with uh, uh, such a stellar cast that we have. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, Professor uh, C. Rajamohan, uh, Director of the Institute of South Asian Studies, National University of Singapore has found the time uh, to join us uh, all the way from Singapore, but he usually uh, does not let us down uh, given his own uh, uh, old loyalties towards this uh, institution. Um, where I can say you initially sprouted your wings, though you, of course, soared very high thereafter. Um, we also have uh, Mr. Mahindra Ved, President Emeritus, Commonwealth Journalists Association, New Delhi. Uh, and we have uh, Professor Ajay Darshan Behra, Director of the WMAJ Academy of International Studies, Jamia Milia Islamia, and then our very own uh, Dr. Ashok K. Behuria, Senior Fellow and Coordinator, uh, South Asia Center, also a walking encyclopedia on matters to do with Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, in the background, I can see that we have our scholar on Afghanistan, Mr. Vishal Chandra, who has been very heavily supporting all this, along with his team, uh, that is uh, Sindhu Dinesh and Mr. Piyush Singh and, and many others. And of course, Vishal Chandra will be delivering the uh, vote of thanks. I must uh, say at the very outset that uh, I will have to leave exactly at uh, uh, 3.35 uh, to attend another event with the Honorable uh, Defense Minister of India with the Raksha Mantri uh, physically elsewhere. Uh, and so therefore, at that point, I will request uh, the Deputy DG, that is my colleague, Major General Bipin Bakshi, to kindly take over at that point of time. Uh, I would uh, request all participants to speak uh, for the standard 15 minutes, uh, and that would give me nearly uh, four speakers, or at least three and a half, if, if there can be a half, uh, within the time that I will be with you. Uh, all questions should be uh, put into the Q&A box at the very bottom right corner of your screen. And uh, I repeat, not in the chat box, because it will be very difficult for anyone to monitor the both uh, of these boxes. Um, uh, all non-speakers at all times, we also kindly keep their mics muted. If there is any technical glitch, we will try to step in and help as best as we can. Now, let me just round up uh, with a few points uh, to set the ball rolling. Um, each of these sessions, as I said, has uh, touched upon uh, new points about uh, Afghanistan and the evolving situation there, but uh, there is also a lot that has emerged in common. And I think one broad point that has uh, stood out is that there is a looming humanitarian crisis there. In fact, it's no longer looming, it's there on the ground. and. Uh, with every passing day, uh, particularly in the uh, bitter cold of the winter, uh, there is a major issue there. I think the international community has agreed that humanitarian assistance uh, for the people of Afghanistan uh, would take priority. Uh, but I think the fly in the ointment here is to ensure that it gets through in a very transparent manner uh, without it all falling uh, into the hands of the regime, which might then divert it for other uses. Uh, another broad point that uh, came out of the discussion so far is the uh, uncertainty surrounding the Taliban regime, though much is made of the fact that they achieved a, a, a stupendous uh, military victory of sorts, uh, not in an all-out all war, which they would not have won, but in an insurgency, which they could, uh, you know, uh, succeed in, in, in taking to its logical conclusion, but that they are not necessarily there to stay, that there is great uncertainty, that they are under duress, they are unable to make the transition from uh, having all along been a violent insurgent uh, uh, group uh, to becoming a uh, acceptable, respectable uh, 
a member of the international community and putting in place a regular government providing good governance uh, to their uh, you know uh, deserving millions now this is also being highlighted in the context of their utter lack of experience the fact that about half a million people fled the country uh, in those fleeing masses uh, you know some clinging to the wheels of uh, 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 aircraft that were taking off and 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 all those uh, you know dramatic scenes that we have seen of departures from the airport uh, hundreds and thousands of technically qualified people have also left those that acquired experience over the last 20 years of being an interface with the international community uh, with technology with modern science uh, with running the machinery of government the departments uh, the critical infrastructure they are no longer there uh, and uh, therefore it is very difficult for the Taliban to actually get down to doing that. And speakers also highlighted the fact that they are essentially a faith based uh, organization uh, and that any difficulty, however, insuperable or insurmountable it might appear to be, the logical answer that the Taliban might have uh, is that uh, let's leave it to God. God provided till now and God will continue to provide. Uh, but that is not necessarily going to uh, address all the uh, questions. Uh, 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 that uh, uh, Afghanistan faces today. So they are, in a sense, caught in a cleft stick. If they remain violent and intolerant, uh, they will continue to uh, invite the ire of the international community. And the international community is presenting a united front today. Uh, just about nobody has recognized them. And there are sanctions in place, even those that are talking to them, uh, you know, like the Americans earlier and the Russians now. Uh, everybody has kept them as a a listed uh, group, you know. If they were to become benign, uh, uh, they will equally be condemned, but this time by the more radical factions and groups in Afghanistan, notably the ISK, uh, who believe that the Taliban have gone soft uh, and that they are no longer as, uh, uh, you know, qualified to, uh, to be there as they once were, and that they are eminently suited for for being the target of criticism and uh, attacks also. We have seen that unfolding in Kandahar, in uh, you know, Kunduz uh, and elsewhere. Uh, so this is the kind of broad situation and when we see uh, what the rest of the world is doing, uh, they're expressing concern for the minorities, for the women. Uh, in a sense, we can also say that uh, many of the people in Afghanistan now are habituated to, uh, especially the younger generation, uh, to living without the Taliban and they've seen what it is like to be part of modern, uh, you know, governance or at least uh, science and technology, uh, having certain freedoms that are taken for granted by the younger generation. And suddenly that is all, uh, you know, uh, not available. War cannot be ruled out, civil war in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, the US uh, uh, has left, uh, uh, obviously under duress, uh, military pressures uh, and having expended much blood and treasure over the years, in my view, having achieved a fair bit, but not entirely having fulfilled their aims and objectives. Uh, but they will not intervene uh, directly ever again unless the homeland is threatened. And even then they might do so in, uh, you know, with different means that are available today, which may not have been available 20 years ago, but today they can do so with a standoff presence or drones or acting out of other bases, etc. So it's not necessary that they would go back at the same way, even if the homeland were threatened. China uh, uh, is not uh, uh, alienated from the US insofar as Afghanistan is concerned, certainly not. They seem to be talking to each other in the uh, Troika Plus uh, and, and other uh, fora, but they're unlikely to pour in the millions and the billions that are being talked about so long as there is such great uncertainty. Um, Russia concerned about malevolence spillover, uh, as are the Central Asian countries, uh, and most of the Central Asians have decided to, uh, you know, make a virtue out of necessity and talk to the Taliban, even in the run up to their takeover and subsequently, except for Tajikistan, which seems to have more chestnuts in the fire uh, than the rest of them, given its long border and uh, the problem with radicals on both sides of the border. Pakistan will support uh, uh, the faction or the Taliban mainstreamed the Haqqani group, etc., uh, for its own sake to ensure that it can also get uh, the TTP off its back with their help, etc. But they're not likely to 
uh, go in pitchfork themselves into some kind of a fight, I would imagine. Um, and if they make the Taliban more Islamist uh, in the hope that they are less nationalist, uh, then there will be greater radicalism in the region, including in Pakistan. If they were to help make them more nationalist uh, and less Islamist, as speakers have suggested, then they were on the risk of the nationalists awakening to the, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, falsity of the Durand line and questioning the territorial integrity of Pakistan. And of course, for India, the primary objective remains uh, uh, building on the goodwill that we have with the people of Afghanistan. India is not interested in propping up this government or that government. Our friendship, as the Prime Minister has said repeatedly, is with the people of Afghanistan. And people who have expended such blood and treasure in trying to do uh, pro bono a great deal for the Afghan people. And we should continue to do that. With these few words, having already introduced the speakers early on, I will turn to my first speaker, uh, Professor C. Rajamohan. The floor is yours. 15 minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Chinoy. Thank you for your warm words. Uh, delighted to be part of this panel. Uh, it's always great to be in the annual uh, the South Asia Conference of uh, the Institute of uh, South Asian Studies. I'm sorry, <laughs> Institute of Defense Studies and, uh, and Analysis. Uh, now, the previous sessions have already covered a lot of ground uh, on the tumultuous development in the region and their and the significance. Uh, Ambassador Chinoy, too, just now, uh, talked, looked, looked ahead and looked at some of the contradictions uh, that are unfolding. Uh, what I thought I'll do is really to look at the longer term consequences of what's happened in Afghanistan uh, for the whole region, not just for Pakistan or Afghanistan, but for the but for the whole region. Uh, I also want to focus on you know the the frame it as a as a dualistic proposition that that there could be two different futures from the choices uh, that get made in Afghanistan that it could lead to two very different outcomes. Uh, in the in, in Afghanistan itself and and within the region, uh, so I, I I'll try and frame it in a stark terms. The two very different types of futures, but in reality, of course, is never going to be. It'll be somewhere in between. But I think for analytical reasons, uh, it's good to see uh, the the kind of uh, contradictions that uh, that that are likely to emerge. The what I would do in the next uh, fifteen minutes is really to focus on three broad themes. Of, of consequence for uh, the subcontinent uh, as, a, as a whole. The, the first question uh, is, what will be the nature of the social and political organization in, in Afghanistan? Uh, now, we've had one kind of a model that was attempted a social and political modernization uh, of Afghanistan uh, within an Islamic uh, constitutional framework, uh, which, which uh, clearly could not succeed uh, and has come under, uh, you know, attacked on the Taliban and Taliban has eventually prevailed. Uh, but today Taliban is not just another government that is coming into Afghanistan, but it is really changing the flag, change, wants to change the constitution, wants to change the name. So what you're talking about is really the restructuring of the Afghan state. An opportunity Taliban had uh, in 96 to 2001, but today it wants to re reconstitute Afghanistan uh, in its own ideological uh, ideological uh, uh, vision for itself. I mean, the rest of the world uh, comes as a consequence, but they have a vision and, and they've not made a secret uh, of the vision. So the question, uh, the, the dual question for us is, uh, will it be a undiluted affirmation of its ideological positions, which they've articulated so far? Or would it be an incremental pragmatic adaptation to the real world? We've seen that in, in most revolutionary states, uh, which whether it's the Bolsheviks, uh, whether it is the Chinese communists or the Iranian uh, Islamic revolutionaries, uh, whatever the ideology you have, uh, there's a pressure to compromise, the pressure to produce uh, a, a, a variation on the original, uh, original conception. But as uh, the DG pointed out a little while ago, that if you give up too much of the ideology, then you are under attack from your flanks, which is what ISK already is saying, look, Taliban is not pure enough. Therefore, you'll have that problem. Uh, and if you, if, you come, if, you, uh, if you stick to your ideology in a, in a pure form, uh, it will become increasingly uh, difficult to govern uh, you know, Afghanistan itself, whether it is the question of 
uh, we're not talking about democracy. I'm not talking about the 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 uh, the, the nature of the, the political organization. But the fact is, if it is going to be a Pashtun dominated this, this uh, government that they want to constitute, then the other significant uh, elements of the population uh, are going to find ways in which to fight. But it'll happen immediately. But I think we are looking at the longer term uh, consequences. So therefore, the choices that Taliban makes in terms of how it wants to proceed. Uh, will have consequences for Afghanistan itself, and that in turn will affect the region. Uh, we're already seeing in Pakistan uh, that the rise of the you know, Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, the TTP and TTP's attitude towards uh, towards Pakistan, are uh, we seeing that uh, they're emulating some of the tactics that the TTA uh, had adopted vis-a-vis -vis the previous government. Uh, it talks about an ideology. Uh, it talks about it sees itself as part of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, but of course the Islamic Emirate denies. Uh, rather than helping Pakistan directly to control the, the, the TTP sheltered in Afghanistan, it is saying, no, you please talk to them. You work out a ceasefire. You negotiate arrangements with them, and we are not going to uh, take responsibility for that, uh, which is really puts the onus on Pakistan to negotiate in terms of settlement uh, with uh, with the with the TTP, uh, whose demands, of course, would normally be unacceptable to any any dominant state. So the 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 biggest consequence immediately, I think, the nature of the religious structure and politics that Taliban wants to bring is beginning to envelop Pakistan. So it's not a question of whether it will. We've already seen in the case of TTP's behavior, and then you have the the TLP. Which is the Tariq al Pakistan. The ideology that brought that Islam must be this driving force for the organization of uh, the, the society of Afghanistan, uh, you, you're beginning to see uh, some of that spillover into, into, uh, into Pakistan. Uh, you have uh, Prime Minister uh, Imran Khan, who is otherwise seen as a great uh, the symbol of Western modernity, uh, today talks about uh, you know, organizing Pakistan on Islamic lines, and then the TLP. Comes in from a much wide, no, much far more right, right wing flank, uh, which is demanding things, uh, which are going to be increasingly hard for the Pakistani state to meet, or it simply compromises. We've already seen uh, some of that happen. So the the prospects of Pakistan coming under a similar ideology have significantly increased with the resurgence of the Taliban and, and its state uh, in Afghanistan. Now, similar forces are in operation in other parts of, uh, say, Bangladesh, uh, where there's a the deep influence of the Afghan uh, Taliban and its political ideology is going to be felt. And in India, too, there will be reaction to this. So, so therefore, the logic of religion as the basis for organizing and how deep that religion should go into organizing your social and political structures, uh, I think we've already seen uh, Pakistan move in that direction. Uh, there could be pressures on Bangladesh, and, and the backlash to that in India uh, can also be ruled out. So therefore, what happens inside Afghanistan in terms of its social political modernization is not going to stay limited to Afghanistan, but it will have deep consequences directly, immediately, we're seeing it in Pakistan, but more widely uh, in the rest of the region. So already we've seen the subcontinent right? come under the greatest sway of religious politics, and if Taliban succeeds and triumphs, that pressure on the rest of the subcontinent uh, will only will only grow, and I think this will be a problem for all major states and all major political parties uh, in the subcontinent. Uh, how they're going to deal with it uh, will be a major uh, major issue. Uh, so, so the, the 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 first, as I said, look, the, the social and political modernization uh, is 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 of one set of consequences. The second I wanted to talk about uh, was on the economic development. What is the kind of economic development model? That Afghanistan will adopt. Uh, what we've seen in the last 20 years and historically in Afghanistan, Afghanistan has very little internal resources to build a, a modern economic society. Uh, that you had the last 20 years, uh, the Afghanistan government could not even finance, generate enough local revenues to finance an army, could not finance uh, you know, a government salary structure. Uh, and historically, Afghanistan was always a weak state, and its capacity to generate enough economic resources uh, with very little resources, natural resources, while there is a lot of speculation of, uh, you know, minerals and all that stuff. I mean, all that 
it will be a while before uh, before that can that can actually be exploited. Uh, so therefore, the the choice of what kind of a model can Pakistan Afghanistan develop, and there it it, it automatically takes you to two two choices. One, it looks for a diverse global economic relationship, that is including the United States and the West. Uh, beyond, I'm not just talking about the aid in the near term, the humanitarian aid and other forms of assistance. But who, how is it going to modernize itself? That, that question, uh, will it be done through Western capital, which is the maximum capital, or does it turn to the Chinese capital? At this point, given Pakistan's influence and the Chinese interest, uh, there is considerable speculation that the Chinese capital, the Chinese state, uh, will be the kind of problem solver for Afghanistan. Like we saw in Pakistan, uh, is a you know, game changer. Chinese money is going to be a game changer. The Chinese projects will be a game changer. This kind of somewhat naive belief that Chinese money will simply transform uh, because Pakistani elite was unwilling to take responsibility for a serious economic strategy. That problem for Afghanistan would be even more serious that, that it needs international support and there it could turn completely to the Chinese and say, look, we'll do what you want. Uh, you create the conditions for economic growth in Afghanistan. Well, if it does that, because that has consequences of its own. And while reaching out to Western capital or international capital uh, would otherwise demand certain meeting certain conditions, which would involve the first set of issues, the social, economic, and political, uh, can it actually uh, meet those uh, conditions? And I think uh, that is the problem uh, that, that uh, Afghanistan will face. And related to this is the uh, question of regional integration. Look at the previous government. It's always talked about Afghanistan as a roundabout, that it will become a bridge between different parts of you know, South Asia, West Asia, Central Asia, China, and that the roads going through it, that will become a highway, a bridge on which economic growth can take place. And that as a connector, its growth model must be based as a connector to the neighboring regions. Uh, but then uh, the, the, much of this, this strategy can only succeed uh, if Afghanistan is an open society, reasonably stable, and, and is willing to work together with its neighboring states. That is, you cannot be a bridge if you're fomenting revolution in other states, if you're hosting revolutionary groups in other states. Therefore, this again takes you back to the core ideological question, that is, that the economic strategy uh, of economic development cannot be completely dissociated from the ideological choices and the ideological inheritance of the Taliban. So therefore, reconciling that will be an issue. That brings me to the, the third set of issues, which is the regional security in a more broader sense. Uh, long ago, uh, Mr. Panikar, Kim Panikar, who's a uh, mature historian, said, uh, whatever happens in the Kabul Valley affects the Indo-Gangetic Plain intensely. That, that, that historically, the Indo-Gangetic Plain uh, the invasions, most of it came through Afghanistan. Therefore, whatever the change in the political distribution of power within the Kabul Valley has an effect on the empires based on the Indus and the Ganges. Therefore, the security structures, of what happens in Afghanistan, are deeply related to what happens elsewhere uh, all across the Indo-Gangetic Plain. So that brings us to the question, uh, what kind of a vision does Taliban have for, for a longer term security of the region? As we said, if it wants to, uh, does it want to be a subaltern to Pakistan or does it want to be an independent autonomous actor? Uh, in what we've seen, the first flashes of some autonomy, I don't know that how uh, long term that is going to be, where it is Afghanistan that put Taliban government that put, put pressure on Pakistan to allow India to send wheat over land. If you recall just a few months ago, uh, Imran Khan government was not even willing to accept uh, any, uh, you know, uh, buying stuff from India, sugar and cotton. Uh, but today, uh, the Afghan government has put some pressure, saying, look, forcing them to accept Indian Indian assistance and moving it through the overland. Of course, there's still a lot of negotiation to be done, whether we get it done or not, uh, whether that actually gets done or not, remains unclear. But the question of what kind of a position that Afghanistan government will take is a be Pakistan, because Pakistan's conception of Afghanistan has been that it should be a protectorate of Afghanistan. Pakistan. Uh, it should be a state where Afghanistan, Pakistan will have a significant influence on the nature of the society, a friendly government, as it said, 
or sometimes we use the word strategic depth uh, in, in the Pakistani literature. But the question is, the aspect is simple, that it wants Afghanistan to be a security buffer as one where significant foreign policy and internal influence accrues to Pakistan. This ambition is not unique, but the fact is that ambition is real. But can that be sustained or does Afghanistan break out of that relationship and look at uh, connecting with the other states, including India, Iran, and Central Asia, and even the United States. So what choices does it make in terms of its regional security configurations uh, would, be, would, be, would be huge. From the Indian perspective, uh, my sense is uh, that for India, uh, a, 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 an autonomous uh, Afghanistan uh, would, be, would be a great value. And there's some, in at least many of us, believe that, look, in the end, uh, that the contradictions between Afghanistan and Pakistan are not resolvable and that Afghans will never accept irrespective of the nature of the government, whether the Durand line or a subaltern status. So that always gave uh, some room for engagement between Delhi uh, and Kabul. Uh, but that, so irrespective of previous positions, good Taliban, bad Taliban, the fact is even a Taliban-led government, uh, would it act independently? Uh, is it capable of taking a strategically autonomous view of the world and ready to engage. But then the dependence on Pakistan uh, is also real. So how this plays out uh, is going to have a critical uh, impact on the regional uh, order as a whole. Uh, the nature of uh, Taliban's relationship with India, with Iran, and with Central Asia uh, are going to be important. But if, if Afghanistan makes a choice in favor of Chinese capital, then the regional integration that the Pakistani friends talk about is really connecting them to the north and be part of the CPEC rather than a horizontally connected uh, Afghanistan uh, that is linked to Iran, that is linked to India, and linked to the West in a, in a much broader sense. So these choices uh, that Afghanistan makes, uh, the Taliban government, uh, will have a huge impact on the nature of the regional order, because already the Chinese influence is fairly significant, and the expansion of the CPEC to uh, Afghanistan, and that, that's the only choice they have. Uh, the question is, then that leads to one kind of an outcome. Many in the West and India, I mean, realists would say that the nature of the internal regime is not important. In Afghanistan, that does not export its revolution. In Afghanistan, that might do all kinds of things inside, but is not promoting revolution, will be far more acceptable to the other governments. Now, that's the way the world works, so it's not a question of good Taliban or bad Taliban. As long as, you know, Afghanistan does not host revolutionary groups, uh, there will be far less international criticism of its structure, and that make it easier for many countries to work with uh, work with the Taliban. But then that includes a choice, again, takes you back to the ideological choices. So let me conclude, I think my time is up, uh, just to say that I think the, the going back to Panikas framework, that, that what happens in Afghanistan is of consequence to us. And I think while we focus on the immediate, the longer term consequences will bring back the historic geographic contradictions uh, that exist between Kabul and Rawalpindi, as well as the links between Kabul and, and Delhi uh, and the nature of the relationship uh, across this vast region. And, and uh, today, I think uh, that, that, that those choices, how they get made, uh, would involve significant internal battles. But I think that's where the longer term choices for, the, uh, for Afghanistan exist. And what they mean for subcontinent as a whole would be uh, the danger of religious extremism or moderation and accommodation to regional economic integration with the rest of the subcontinent and Iran or linking up with China, and third, that does it follow an autonomous security role where it is less threatening to the rest of the region. So, so I think these are the broad uh, dualities that I think have begun to emerge. Uh, Ambassador Chino, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rajamohan, for those uh, very enlightening comments on the way forward, and also for particularly highlighting all these contradictions between uh, ideology and good governance, between uh, being a subaltern to Pakistan and trying to be independent in terms of its own foreign policy or regional integration. Uh, but there were two uh, points which kind of intrigued me. One is about Chinese capital, uh, whereas the world thinks the Chinese have uh, uh, very deep pockets. Uh, the Chinese uh, are not known to throw their money around. So they would be very careful uh, in what they do in Afghanistan uh, because they certainly don't want to lose all that money. And who's going to protect the Chinese projects there. Will it be Pakistani troops within Pakistan? Chinese projects can be as part of the CPEC be uh, protected by uh, a, a special force that they have raised for that purpose. But who will carry out 
uh, that kind of work in an Afghanistan in which uh, factions may attack one another simply to uh, get the better of the situation. So I, I don't quite see how this uh, chimera of uh, Chinese capital uh, will actually turn out to be real. Uh, the other is about Afghanistan not promoting revolution and being acceptable so long as what it does stays within its borders and doesn't spill over. But then one might say that the Taliban themselves being Afghans were never really interested in exporting revolution. It is the presence of Al Qaeda, which had uh, a, a, a pan global kind of vision uh, that, you know, once uh, uh, take, they took root in Afghanistan, made Afghanistan uh, fall into the category of a country that was exporting revolution. So Taliban now as then probably didn't have a uh, very large, uh, you know, regional or global objectives. Uh, it, today, the question is not about the Al Qaeda. It's more about the ISK. If the ISK stages a comeback and takes root or gets the better of the Taliban, then they might do exactly what the Al Qaeda did 20 years ago with uh, the Taliban being simply uh, what one might call, uh, you know, people who don't know better and with a medieval mindset being taken for a ride by both the groups. But you will definitely have something to say down the line on this. If you permit me, I would then move to the uh, next speaker. That is Mr. Mahendra Ved. Uh, uh, Professor Ved, the floor is yours. You're going to speak about a long, violent road ahead for Afghanistan. That's quite petrifying and disturbing. But I think most would agree with you. Please unmute yourself. Do we have you on board? You can speak. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. Uh, give me a minute. No, we can hear you. Uh, Sorry for the delay. Many thanks for inviting me to participate in the 13th South Asia Conference, uh, meant to focus on Taliban too. Thanks are due to the Director General, Ambassador Chinoy, and others at MPIDSA, especially Dr. Vishal Chandra, who brought me into this. I was Taliban one from a distance as part of my field work in Europe and five of the Central Asian republics while writing books on Afghanistan with the late Sridhar of IDSA. An Indian journalist was not welcome then. I'm not sure how far I would be welcome even today. 24 years have passed and so much has changed, but I'm not sure how much has changed with the Taliban. Many of those with who were in Taliban one, ironically, are seen as softliners today, while they have given birth to a new generation of hardliners who are calling the shots in Taliban two. I am a journalist amongst the soldiers, uh, diplomats, and academics. I'm afraid my approach is going to be basically Indian and hardline. Uh, Taliban's return to power in Afghanistan has been one of the most shocking events of this year. The world was helplessly as a government simply collapsed under the sweep of a military campaign. Its armed forces withered away, lawmakers became useless, and an elected president fled the country. It marks the victory for some, defeat for some others, but a cause of concern for all in a world that is already witnessing serious erosions in the rule of law, and in the way democratic institutions are faring in many nations of the world. Whatever the flaws, and they were numerous, Afghanistan had witnessed a semblance of democracy. Now, there is no word on what use would there be of the National Assembly complex that India built and gifted to the Afghan people. Accepting that Taliban's being in control of Afghanistan is a fait accompli. The world needs to deal with them. They took power four months ago 
which is too short a time in the life of any people. Taliban have sought four more months. This has been conveyed to the U.S. and the Taliban could be could well be buying time since $20 billion are in American uh, banks. Given their internal fissures, widely believed to be deep, one can only wait and watch. History has many instances of such clashes between rival groups fighting for freedom or power between the planners and, and negotiators and the field commanders. In this case, it is also driven by the concentration of Islam, the way it is to be interpreted by them. Among the hardliners, the position of the Haqqanis seems to be the strongest. They control key ministries. They drove the military campaign. They, as per a report in New York, Halil Haqqani demanded the surrender of President Ghani and his security chief Mohim. This indicates that that group was not likely to obey any undertaking given by their negotiators in Doha. The world community seeks the new rules to make their government inclusive, involving including women and ethnic minorities in the governance. The situation on the ground is quite the opposite. There is no indication of Uzbeks, Tajiks, or Hazaras being uh, allowed in the administration role in a significant way. As for women's participation, Mujahid, the spokesman, promises overall change. But Mutaki, the acting foreign minister, has claimed in an interview with the AP that girls are going to school and colleges in 10 of the 34 districts. Others then claims in official interviews, anything coming from the civil society sources or media here paints a very grim picture. Women, even the sole, even sole bread earners, are not being allowed to work. This is being contradicted in another AP interview by former President uh, Hamid Karzai, who said that there is uh, too much of negative campaign against the Taliban. Now, Mr. Karzai and Dr. Abdullah are in Kabul, engaged in very delicate talks with the Taliban. And one would expect them to paint only a positive picture of what is happening. Assuming the changes in the world, uh, changes the world seeks may come at some time. They may still be cosmetic. Afghanistan is the deeply patriarchal society, not amenable to change. Neither the British, nor the Russians, nor the Americans were able to penetrate beyond the cities. Women have remained second class and worse. More important, Taliban cannot afford to engage in any kind of glasnost, not them not when they are fighting the ultra-radicals of the Islamic State came. It will have to be a prolonged wait and watch before the regime can formally be recognized. Much of the world still thinks it can lean on the Taliban to introduce even a semblance of inclusiveness in the way they should govern themselves. It is highly desirable, no doubt, but is it doable? I'm not very confident. The pressure should need to be maintained by the world community. The same world community wanted Pakistan to do more on fighting terrorism for two decades. That do more is now, was never, never enough. It is now the Taliban's turn to be asked to do, do more on getting inclusive. The outcome, I suspect, is not going to be very different. Just as the Taliban set out American presence in Afghanistan for two decades. They will continue to sit out all the world's pressures. Pakistan, as you know, is a common factor and facilitator. Despite the broad consensus on the wait and watch resolve, it is likely to be gradually watered down because some nations and their governments will want to do business. There is aid to be conducted and Afghan resources to be explored and exploited. This does sound crazy cynical, but that is how they, that is the way nations work. That is how they work in uh, Myanmar or, or in Indonesia when ruled by military dictators. For now, the reason most understandably is Afghan's economic condition that demands urgent relief. The United Nations have set out a relief fund. France and other European countries are working to open mission in Afghanistan without granting recognition. The U.S. has launched efforts 
members of U.S. Defense and Foreign Relations Committees were in Islamabad last week. Significantly, retired American generals and diplomats who worked in Afghanistan in the last 20 years have sought a bank that will not let Afghan economy to collapse in future. The Gulf nation, the OIC, among others, can be expected to make their contributions to avert humanitarian crisis. Pakistan has established Afghan Relief Fund for receiving donations from both domestic and international donors to help the war ravaged country. The announcement by Islamabad does not say how it is going to be passed on to the Afghans. It is likely that Pakistan may receive and funnel aid to Afghan uh, from various Islamic governments and charities. One only hopes that like it had happened with the American Stinger missiles in the early 1990s, these funds do not get diverted elsewhere. The situation, as I see, is that onus is on the world community to save the Afghans from their misery, whether or not the new rulers accept the red lines drawn. India's case is special. It was among the first to quit Kabul when the Taliban arrived and among the last in the region to establish contact. Behind the scene, contact, contacts have been made and official interaction uh, in Qatar has taken place. A, a crucial contact is acting Deputy Foreign Minister in the new regime, Sher Mohammad Abbas Sistanakzai. He has been some, somewhat forthcoming. He has reportedly appreciated India's work at $3 billion worth of projects. India can build on this Stanakzai's past training as an army officer. At some stage, it may get more than a foothold in the diplomatic door. The challenge for India is having to deal with the Haqqanis, who have a past record of acting as Pakistan's proxies and attack India's interests in Afghanistan. India has made urgent efforts to rush medicine and food supplies. Pakistan prevaricated and then relented to allow Afghan vehicles to collect Indian supplies. It is a one-off concession, Islamabad insists. My own two-penny observation is that whether or not Pakistan gains strategic depth with Taliban in power in Afghanistan, it has certainly gained some commercial depth and to, to regain the Afghan market, which it had lost to India and China, because Indian supplies from Delhi and the airlifts have stopped. For all is the all his past investments and goodwill that it enjoys among the Afghan people, India has not had many friends. Globally and regionally, it is identified with the Americans. Its equations with the two key allies of the past, Russia and Iran, have changed. But together, all have worked to tame the common enemy, terrorism. Top security officials of five Central Asian states, Iran and Russia, attended a regional security dialogue on Afghanistan that was hosted by India on November 10. I'll likely move to invite five of the Central Asian Republic presidents as chief guests at the next Republic Day. It is an important move for India's outreach. The Putin visit was another important move when two sides emphasized on reaching humanitarian aid to the Afghans. The Delhi Declaration on Afghanistan said all the eight countries were committed to combat terrorism to ensure that Afghanistan would never become a safe haven for global terrorism. All the countries had call, also called the formation of a truly inclusive government in Kabul. It is important for Central Asia because Afghanistan's ethnic minorities come from there. The most important factor is the growing presence of China. It is not favorably placed towards India, as we know, and is Pakistan's biggest ally riding piggyback into Afghanistan and more. This adds to India's challenge in a big way. India needs to revive the Chabahar port with Iran to refrain access to Afghanistan and Central Asia. Here, Uzbekistan is crucial for India's plans to boost connectivity. The three of them, 
form a trilateral working group on joint use of Chabahar. It's a long, difficult, and violent road ahead for Afghans to achieve political stability, economic relief that will save, the, save them from hunger and disease, and then securing a semblance of human rights. Ajonama has sounded the alarm bell as winter sets in. All along, it has been urging equal rights for all Afghans and emphasized on the role of women, including education for girls. One minute. Report, the report talks of, also talks, and I quote, avalanche of hunger and destitution among the Afghans, emphasizing that almost all Afghans, 98%, do not have enough to eat. A, a failing economy could end Afghanistan, to tip Afghanistan, increasingly dire situation into a catastrophe next year. As per the UN estimates, it affects 23 million Afghans. Drought conditions have added to rural distress, and 70% of Afghans live in villages. Death and disease, particularly for starved and malnourished children, affect a whole generation. Sadly, Yonama has also recorded a 47% rise in violence in Afghanistan during 2021 compared to the previous year. There is a definite spike since August. It has called for significant efforts by the Taliban to arrest this trend. Reports is just out from Geneva by the UN Human Rights Council. It says that 100 extra judicial killings have taken place since the Taliban took power. May I request you to wind up, please? May I request you to wind up, please? says that between request you to wind up please okay it says between august and november at least 72 of them are attributed to taliban in several cases bodies of those killed were publicly displayed this has exacerbated the situation taliban foreign uh, spokesmen have denied some of these reports and they say that they are not substantiated now who is going to substantiate the UN report also says that militants of the ISK have also been among those killed. Several districts have been ISK strongholds and battles have been going on. Given the circumstances, this can be indefinite. What if this encourages a reverse traffic? Just as Pakistan's TTP used Afghan tribal areas as safe haven, can the ISK uh, use the same do the same with Pakistan territory as safe haven. One cannot but conclude this on a note of concern, even alarm, as things have developed in the last four months. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mahindraved, for also sounding this uh, uh, very acute note of caution. Um, at this stage, uh, uh, frankly, if uh, uh, Professor Ajay Dehra permits, I just want to get uh, Mr. Raja Mohan back in Professor Raja Mohan in for five minutes before handing over the floor to you, uh, because I was the one who uh, actually asked him a couple of things or rather commented on his uh, presentation and he was about to say something uh, when I said that we will do it later. So, Professor Raja Mohan, why don't you chip in here uh, with a, a few minutes of your reaction to basically what I said uh, and then, of course, you will continue to say something more in the Q&A session. Uh, Professor Raja Mohan. Right, it's uh, likely that he's uh, taken a break. Uh, Professor Ajay Behra, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Chinoy, uh, for this invitation and to the other organizers uh, in uh, IDSA. It's my honor <clears throat> to be associated with this uh, conference. Uh, well, I've had two erudite speakers, thinkers uh, speaking before me. Um, I would just like to focus on, on, on the, my title of uh, peril of legitimization. Uh, it's kind of difficult to predict. I mean, uh, the development since uh, 15th August. Uh, 
we are caught up in a situation which is a cash 22 situation where do we accept the taliban as the new rulers in afghanistan do we have any choices or we do not have choices and this is where i think one of the most important questions uh, that we have to address and deal with is uh, can the taliban be removed by force or if it cannot if that is the realization uh, then then the question comes and how do we deal with the taliban now uh, for the future and this is where i think the question of legitimacy comes in that uh, at least this time around uh, that the international community was uh, much more clearer uh, even though after august 15 it seemed uh, that uh, many countries were willing to deal with the taliban uh, but i think better sense has prevailed and uh, in the course of time uh, most countries have realized that uh, while we need to engage with the taliban uh, but at the same time they haven't given recognition to taliban now it has its own problems and challenges and uh, this is where i think uh, it's easy to point out to the challenges uh, but difficult to show the way forward or the road map uh, what what is likely to happen i mean we've got some uh, ideas from uh, professor rajamohan's presentation uh, we've got some ideas from uh, mr mindavit's uh, presentation but what is it that the international community should be doing and what uh, you know particularly uh, india should be doing in regard to <coughs> dealing with the taliban i think one reality that we have to face up to is that there is probably no short term solution to the problem in afghanistan uh, i think one of the uh, realizations has to be that uh, this is this is this is a long term game uh, which we have to uh, play now uh this <clears throat> which has its own consequences for the region i mean the regional security environment has has completely changed i mean we we had a regional security environment uh, prior to the taliban takeover and a regional security environment which has got far more complicated uh, after the taliban takeover in 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 uh, afghanistan which basically goes to suggest uh, that we have to be in this situation for a fairly long time because there are no easy solutions and 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 there are no short term solutions uh, one of the questions which i just raised is the question of force uh, what seems likely as kind of uh, internal resistance uh, to the taliban which is what uh, happened at least in 1996 uh, when the taliban had taken over that you had a pocket of resistance and 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 many probably felt that you know similarly this time there would be some resistance which is going to uh, grow over a period of time but unfortunately uh, that there doesn't seem to be any uh, resistance which is uh, uh, the taliban seems to be completely have uh, dominated uh, the, the uh, over the entire country territorially it is much more in control uh than what it was uh, when it had taken power in uh, 1996 but i do not know whether we should be completely ruling out the question of force uh i think that's a question which should be contingent contingent on many factors uh as of now uh, the realization that why is it that the united states got got into a dialogue and negotiations with the taliban because of a realization that you could not defeat the taliban the realization that the taliban is central to any solution in 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 afghanistan and of course that the united states was tired of a long war from which uh, it needed to withdraw now <clears throat> with that realization we realize that the question of force is something which is very very untenable Uh, at least in the immediate context but if uh, things turn around within afghanistan what should be the role of the regional powers uh, i mean is it, is it that uh, given the fact that uh, you know countries haven't really accepted the taliban regime uh, countries are willing to deal with the taliban regime is a different issue 
And one of the reasons why, you know, most countries in the region and in the national community are willing to deal with the Taliban is not really because of the Taliban. It is essentially due to the humanitarian crisis uh, within Taliban. And that's something you cannot look at, uh, look away from. Uh, it, it becomes a responsibility, both of the international community and the regional countries to see that the, you know, the eco economic situation does not become so bad uh, that that has uh, regional, uh, you know, security repercussions as well. Uh, leave about the moral side uh, of the question uh, that uh, the levels of poverty and the difficulties in which uh, the people are, uh, unfortunately, uh, a choice uh, that they never made, a choice which has been imposed on them uh, by the uh, by the Taliban having uh, uh, taken over ha having taken over power. Now the question is, I think uh, one of the most important thing that we need to study and which uh, I, I don't know, there are many perceptions, interpretations. Uh, I mean, it, it's still being said around that, uh, you know, the Americans themselves did not understand the Taliban despite dealing with them for such a long time, despite the presence in the United States, in, in Afghanistan for more than 20 years. Uh, there are also questions about whether the Pakistanis also do understand the Taliban. I mean, leave apart countries like Russia, China, and the, uh, Iran, and other players, uh, that who really understands the Taliban, uh, the, the assumption that the Taliban is going to transform the, the assumption or, or signals from the Taliban that, that it has transformed. I mean, this is one of the points that has come out very clearly. Uh, post, uh, you know, the U.S. negotiations with the Taliban, whatever expectations you had, that this was a transformed Taliban. And now that's something which I, I have never felt that, you know, you could have actually ever made a distinction between the good Taliban and the bad Taliban. And, and ideologically, the Taliban can transform. I mean, they've made some good signals, uh, good, 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 uh, you know, vibes. But the fact that the kind of regime which is which has come about the 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 i mean the international community keeps saying and the taliban itself keeps saying that they also want to have an inclusive government but there is absolutely no clarity on what is their understanding of version of an inclusive government and by the end of it the the interim cabinet that they have formed of 33 members in which they are uh, uh, 31 members of Pashtuns. One Tajik and one Uzbek. Uh, forget about women's representation. Forget about the issues of human rights or a pluralistic political system. So what? What? What is the most one of the one of the issues out here is that the nature of the state or the nature of the regime that we are confronted with. Uh, if we say that this is long term, so we are we are assuming that we will have a regime here. Uh, which is which is not going to be democratic, which is not going to be inclusive, uh, which is uh, there is no question of uh, electoral democracy. That would obviously raise some very very uh, important questions within Afghanistan. That how long will that kind of a system prevail? Uh, how, to what extent uh, that kind of a system will have stability? Uh, are we going to assume that there will be no internal contradictions? Um, though at this point of time, we realize that the resistance to the Taliban uh, from the various, uh, you know, uh, uh, oppositional factions, the warlords, etc., uh, is not there. But to assume again that the Taliban would have the kind of hegemony over that society. And this is where I make a distinction. I mean, why the reason why I'm using the term hegemony is that how long will the Taliban be able to rule uh, the country? just on the basis of force. And this is where the question of legitimacy comes in, that is this going to be an illegitimate government all throughout, where there is no acceptance from the people? Uh, that, that, that is fairly clear, unless and until, I mean, if, I mean, uh, this is again an assumption on my part, that unless and until we assume that because the people don't have a choice, uh, you just simply have to accept the fact that, you know, you're being ruled by the, Taliban, because you know they have been able to come to power, uh, 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 power through force. 
and 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 people just accept that reality but the role of a state uh, and this is where i think uh, professor rajamoon's uh, points about the vision economic integration the economic turnaround if that's possible you know, what we see is what kind of delivery this state is going to do or this regime is going to do uh is this will this regime be successful in 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 addressing the service issues uh, uh, uh delivering services to the people uh the the country is in a dire state we just uh this is just the beginning but will people i mean we can again assume that the afghan economy will turn into a kind of a war economy people will have to adapt to the reality that this is no longer a uh, economy which is uh, uh, you know which is function which is functional economy uh, economy which anyway had serious structural issues that uh, economy which was almost 75% dependent on 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 foreign aid uh, uh, economy which which just does not have the prospect possibilities of of growth and this is where it's a serious challenge for the taliban to address this issue and where i think it connects to this issue of the international community uh, having put its foot down and put a stop to all the assistance or you know the uh, uh, sanctions which still continue the un sanctions which continue on some of the uh, taliban leaders uh, the economic strangulation if i may use the word strangulation uh, but at the same time uh, the vision countries which are trying to see if uh, you know on one side of course the humanitarian issue because of which the national community has already raised substantial amount of money uh, for the uh, the in uh, for the for the country uh, but eventually i think the international community has some leverage and these are the leverages which i think the national community i mean whether there is going to be a global response or some of the regional countries will go their own way uh, in dealing with the issue and this is where the question of you know regional economic integration that professor rajawan was talking about uh, whether the chinese are going to stop the step in uh, because of uh, uh, their own uh, uh, own interests and i and i i i think uh, you know that probably may not work out uh, simply for the reason is that in 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 the, in the present circumstances uh, uh unless you link globally uh, i do not know whether the chinese can simply make investments and where is the market for the uh, i mean the fact that the, the afghan economy uh, is not in a position to generate wealth on it itself what can it export to the world how does it generate wealth this is this is almost like a like a structural problem that the pakistani economy has where you know it is not able to create wealth through taxation or through uh, industrial production uh, and therefore you know you you are caught up in a kind of a you know economic maze uh, the afghan economy also has similar kind of structural issues because of which uh, it will not be able to uh, you know get out of the trap and, and will be dependent on aid uh, it has been dependent on aid and whether that aid is going to be uh, forthcoming uh, to the taliban uh, for a long time i do not uh, one 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 cannot predict at this stage the final point i would like to make my final point I, i i will just take half a minute more is that uh, the issue of legitimacy for the taliban which i think uh, you know recognizing the taliban regime also kind of uh, gives credence to pakistan strategy uh, we can give get into a discussion in the question answer session uh, but uh, the delegitimization of this regime is very important to the delegitimization of all other jihadi groups with the pakistani uh, establishment the military establishment supports i don't want to expand it at this point of time because i have run short of time but this is something which we need to discuss uh, it, it it is something which is of great concern to india that how do we have a strategy which deals uh, not only with the present crisis in afghanistan but also in ways in which 
we are able to deal with the problem, challenge of state-sponsored terrorism from Pakistan. Thank you very much uh, uh, for giving me that time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Behra. And uh, I think you left us with that very uh, sort of uh, disturbing thought that uh, the normalization of the Taliban, no matter how hard uh, Pakistan and many others try, uh, is going to prove to be very difficult. Uh, and uh, the greatest worry then should be that if the Taliban are going to have a failed sort of state there, uh, and they are, uh, you know, in some kind of netherworld there, uh, neither black nor white nor, uh, you know, legitimate nor illegitimate, uh, will all the fugitives of the world, will all the radicals of the world make a beeline for that uh, safe haven again? And uh, what kind of uh, uh, malevolence will then radiate out of Afghanistan? Uh, towards the rest of the region and the world at large. Who knows? Uh, at this stage, may I bring in Professor Raja Mohan with uh, the understanding of our uh, last speaker, Dr. Ashok Behuria. I hope you will bear with me uh, because I have to leave in another uh, six minutes. And uh, Professor Raja Mohan, if you could speak for yeah. another five, five minutes yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Thanks, um, Ambassador Chinoy. And uh, Really, I think the, the two questions that you raised, I mean, I, before coming to that, I just want to say a word about the normalization of the Taliban. Uh, I think it's already beginning to happen. I, mean, I think uh, whether it is uh, the friends of Pakistan, certainly China, and to some extent, even the Russians uh, are willing to engage on terms that are lesser than uh, what the UNSC resolution, while the UNSC resolution will remain there, uh, how states are actually operate on the ground uh, that could begin to that could begin to change, and I think this is where this is not just a question of the international system as a jury uh, waiting to judge upon Pakistan. Each major power is going to decide on its own uh, on its own merits. Whether the Europeans who want to rush in and deliver humanitarian assistance, whether the Chinese uh, who, and who want to help Pakistan by legitimizing the Taliban, or Pakistan itself uh, operating uh, actually in a way as if there is nothing uh, uh, issue there. So, so I think that normalization. I think the world gets used to new facts, uh, and, and I think we should not be too uh, expecting that they, just because there is a piece of paper called the UNSC resolution, everyone is actually agreed on that. Uh, Ambassador Chinoy has dealt with the UN. I mean, the resolutions reflect a general sentiment, and the way each country interprets it uh, is always uh, something. So I think we got that's something we have to watch. So it's not a given that it won't be normalized or it will automatically be, be normalized. On the question of Chinese capital, I mean, I think. Uh, what you said is right. In a sense, uh, the capacity of China to export capital is slowing down because of China's own economic growth is slowing down. And even in CPEC, which is supposed to be the showcase, there is a lot of uh, it, recent reports suggest uh, it, many projects have slowed down. Uh, Chinese are not coming in as forthcoming as they've been. And within Pakistan itself, there has been a lot of unhappiness, resistance to uh, the projects uh, that, uh, that China, China was going to do. But I think given where Taliban is, where Afghanistan is, China doesn't have to put too much money at this stage to gain the geopolitical advantage. And that is at this point, if it is gets fully isolated by the by the international system, uh, then for the Taliban, for the Pakistan, say, look, this drawing the Chinese, at least you begin to break out of the isolation. To that extent, I think the Chinese money or Chinese capital can play a role. And extending CPEC uh, simply horizontally into Afghanistan should not be too too complicated, uh, given uh, where it is. And you remember they were into the copper mine long ago. How they get to move it, uh, uh, all that will remain a question. But but my sense is uh, that if China approaches this one, you approach is purely in a commercial sense, there's not going to be much logic. But if it approaches through strategic sense, that here is a moment to take advantage of the situation and the American retreat and to sanitize the southern periphery of Xinjiang, uh, the Chinese might be willing to put some cash uh, for strategic gains. Uh, and I think as they've done in countries, basket cases, like uh, you could say uh, Venezuela, many places where they're putting money uh, purely for political reasons. So, but the amounts needed there are not going to be too much. But I think it is something, as you rightly said, we've got to keep our fingers crossed and watch this uh, carefully. The second, on the uh, internal and revolutionary uh, exports, See, many friends of the Taliban have tried to campaign. Look, they really, what is it, local boys with a code of honor? What does that said? Uh, or that they would not really 
push for revolution uh, abroad. So therefore, if we satisfy them on the internal things, they'll be quite happy to do a deal. But that deal was negotiated, but it didn't work out. So if you remember the, the two weeks between 9-11 attack and the American negotiation with the Taliban, saying that, look, we have no quarrel with you. You throw out Al-Qaeda, be quite happy to be friends with you. But that didn't work out. That the attempted negotiation with the Taliban say, look, you take care of yourself. We have no quarrel with you. At that, uh, Mullah Omar was not willing to deliver on that. And you remember, uh, the, the again in the 98, uh, just after they came to power, again at that time, the Clinton administration tried to negotiate with the Taliban. Uh, that handles, handles, you know, bin Laden, and because this is after the Somalia attacks. Uh, you hand him over, we'll be quite happy to work with you. At that time, too, the negotiation failed because Mullah Omar was not willing to uh, yield. Uh, today, I don't know enough on the ground where the situation is. We know that a lot of international terrorist organizations are operating. Are they operating in defense of the Taliban wishes or in, in acquiescence of the Taliban wishes? We don't know. So I think the, the question whether the Taliban is a purely nativist force or is it prepared to shed its historic links with other groups, that I think remains open-ended. I'm sure that will be an issue of debate within the Taliban itself, because like in all, uh, you're, you're familiar with the Chinese history and, and the, uh, you know, the, the calculations in the revolutionary regimes, they have to calculate those. And I think that's where some of the contradictions you pointed out in your initial remarks will also come into, come into light. But, but I think uh, this is again, uh, we, we shouldn't prejudge the outcomes uh, at this point. Uh, that's why I said, look, in a, hypothetically two different scenarios of what could emerge, because at this point, it's good to intellectually clarify the potential pathways uh, so that effective uh, policy responses can be crafted uh, purely in an analytical sense. I'll stop here, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Professor Raja Mohan, for also uh, honoring me with your response to my uh, brief comments. At this stage, may I request the uh, Deputy DG to kindly uh, chair the rest of the session. Uh, and I want to remind our uh, eminent panel panelists that there is time and that after Dr. Ashok Behuria has spoken uh, for his 15 minutes, uh, the uh, you know, panel might consider uh, not only taking uh, questions, but also raising perhaps questions uh, among yourselves and uh, using the rest of the time uh, to uh, you know, its fullest. Uh, so each of you will be uh, you know, heard very eagerly by our uh, very good uh, attendance today. Uh, there's more than 60 people listening in. Uh, so, over to you, uh, uh, General Bakshi, and uh, uh, for the moment, goodbye from my side. I, I'm, I'm very grateful and, and also profoundly apologetic that I have to leave at this stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, and uh, welcome again to all the panelists. Uh, so, uh, I would not, now like to in, invite the fourth speaker, uh, Dr. Ashok Behuria. He's a senior fellow with us and the coordinator of our South Asia Center. Uh, I think all of us are very familiar with him. Uh, he's he's uh, worked earlier at the International Center for Peace Studies, Delhi, and he's been the editor of International Studies, the prestig prestigious research journal from JNU. Uh, and he's done a lot of academic work, primarily pertaining to South Asia. He's also been once awarded the K. Subramanian Award for Excellence for his work on Pakistan in 2009. And he has recently written his book on the Taliban Pakistan origin, evolution, and future portents. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, I'll, I'll hand over to Dr. Ashok. Ashok, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for that uh, gracious introduction. Uh, let me now uh, share my perspective with all of you. In fact, for the last two days, we have been hearing about uh, the return of Taliban and the concerns uh, from different quarters. And uh, today also in this session, we have heard you know, how people are very, very concerned about the way Taliban have uh, returned to power and how they are uh, conducting themselves. In fact, uh, the views of uh, Professor Raja Mohan, I have nothing to disagree with. And similarly, you know, the concerns expressed by uh, Professor Behra and uh, Mr. Abed also are also quite genuine. Uh, I, I, as an academic, as a social uh, belonging to the social scientist uh, uh, stream, 
the social science stream, I would say that you know most of the social phenomena are uh, in fact uh, multidimensional and uh, they're quite open-ended. They can be interpreted anyway. Uh, and from that perspective, also the responses to uh, these phenomena and uh, interpretations of these phenomena are also multifarious and plural. Uh, there cannot be uh, uh, one single interpretation of the phenomena that we get to see in front of us. From that perspective, let, let me uh, throw in my bit here, my two penny here. Uh, in fact, I consider that how do we approach Taliban and how do we approach this post August 15 Afghanistan? I, I, I would say that you know there are three different ways in which we can approach it. One, you accept and engage. The second will be reject and disengage. And third will be stay dif indifferent. So I will inter I will analyze these three different uh, approaches that I have outlined. Uh, let us now talk about you know uh, let us uh, go from top bottom to top. Let us anal analyze whether we can stay indifferent. In fact, there are a lot of uh, events uh, in the past which has happened uh, pertaining to Afghanistan where the world has remained very indifferent. Uh, uh, during eighty nine to ninety six. Uh, and beyond, I think to 2001, the world was indifferent towards Afghanistan. We were indifferent towards Afghanistan. So what was the result? The result was it became, uh, a, 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 you know, a, basically a nest of terror. And that is the time when even the world saw people like Osama bin Laden, you know, migrating to Afghanistan and making his base there. And then we had 9-11. So indifference, in international uh, um, uh, issues, and especially for a country like Afghanistan, which Professor Azamon quoting came, Panika told us that Afghanistan, uh, what Afghanistan uh, uh, happens in Afghanistan today has implications for the Indo-Pacific. I would say that, you know, given the kind of situation, uh, the location that Afghanistan is in, and given the kind of relationship it has with its Central Asian, West Asian, and uh, South Asian neighbors. Now, I would like to uh, like uh, like to misquote the French philosopher who once said that if Afghanistan uh, catches cold, the whole of South Central West Asian countries sneeze. So, in that sense, in Afghan, we are living in an interconnected world, and indifference is not an answer. In in fact, by remaining indifferent, we will make matters worse. Uh, let me now go to the the second uh, um, uh, postulation. Uh, whether we should uh, reject uh, Taliban because they don't have legitimacy. Uh, this is also a, a, a very, very, I would say, a lopsided view of things uh, in, in the sense that uh, what we consider uh, illegitimate, uh, many people in Afghanistan might be considering them as legitimate. In fact, if we, we should uh, not uh, forget that uh, United States of America, after fighting out Taliban for all these years, after 20 years, they recognized it as, as, as a reality. So to be, to be a devil's advocate, also you find that it, it, uh, an organization like Taliban, which was declared as a terrorist organization, uh, today we heard even Russians are also very chary of, you know, removing that tag of terrorist organization from you know, the Taliban. Uh, even then, the Russians, the Chinese, the uh, Iranians, the Americans, they all agree that, you know, Taliban are an alternative. I will now uh, give out some anecdote. You know, in 2018, I had been to Beijing and I was uh, being hosted by the uh, our counterpart there, you know, IDSS counterpart, CISS, and, uh, I think Chinese Institute for Security Studies, which is an adjunct of the Ministry of Defense in China. So they took us to the president of the institute who happened to be the vice chief of the PLA. So he asked us, ask me questions, I will answer. I will be happy to answer. I asked him a simple question. I said, don't you think that the, the government in Kabul is a legitimate government and we should be dealing with them rather than talking to the Taliban on the slack? And he had a very long winded answer, which lasted about 25 minutes. 
and he went back into history and came back to the present times and the, towards the end he made one one single answer one single sentence about one single sentence as an answer he said you have to answer me and this is the answer to your question i am asking you this do you think china would have been peaceful had the pla not been recognized then i counter asked i said do you think pla is an equivalent of taliban here he said you hazard your guess so that is how it is so the point i'm making is by 2018 they had all agreed that this is the uh, this is the organization that we must run to if you want to see afghanistan peaceful so if we are rejecting it we can reject taliban because it is illegitimate because it is doing all this thing to the women the minorities and this is something which is uh, uh, quite uh, as a liberal uh, as a democrat you can also feel very very incensed very very outraged by what uh, the, the taliban are doing uh, and in fact in the world also we see uh, the countries like you know for some, for some time cuba cuba was also not recognized you know not acceptable to the liberal world uh, today you have north korea it's not acceptable uh, so that will not help uh, matters in the sense afghans also have a habit of subsisting uh, at a very low level in fact they can uh, what to say they are resilient enough to persist at a subsistence level so that is not going to uh, you know make matters any better so in that sense uh, rejecting uh, the taliban entirely perhaps is not uh, an option that we should be thinking about especially when we now get to see that you know the, the many powers in the world they have started recognizing uh, the value of uh, recognizing taliban as a reality if not recognizing taliban as a government so in that sense that doesn't remain an option the third option that we uh, can examine is acceptance and engagement so do we accept and engage because from tomorrow yesterday we are hearing people are saying that uh, humanitarian crisis has unfolded in afghanistan and it is necessary for the international community to uh, run into their help and we should get in there we should help them out so this is another option we should engage uh, but they many of them are saying that we should engage but be a little cautious uh, so in that sense you know we should now take a back seat and try to analyze uh, ye afghanistan is very very conservative under taliban and there are also other elements which are which have sprung up like professor azam also said there are there are, there are elements who are saying that you know if we if the, the, the taliban are in uh, in a dilemma uh, when if they become a little too liberal then the isk comes out and says that you know these are the guys who are not islamic enough we are islamic enough take us in uh, if they are rigid then the international community continues to curse taliban uh, uh, as, uh, as a very i would say conservative uh, organization so they are in the cleft of a dilemma but at the same time we just look around you know all the islamic neighbors of afghanistan what are they you have a theocracy in iran you have a wahhabite system at work in all over west asia western asia and most of the countries in west asia the world has happily recognized them and engaged them haven't we it is only because as professor azamun pointed out that you know they are not resource rich they do not have resource enough so that is why we cannot afford to ignore them entirely so this is this is another argument that i am advancing i am not advocating any of this position that i am espousing here i am putting out here so the point is the world has engaged conservative regimes elsewhere so it's not that you know we are engaging taliban like government for the first time in the history of the world and what has happened in other countries the pace of progress the pace of modernization the pace of moderation has been very very slow you got to see saudi is allowing the women to drive only couple of years back and in other countries also similarly we have seen you know you have we have seen the case of uh, uh, princess latifa of uae and we are all the while engaging uae so 
wouldn't you wouldn't you consider them uh, islamic and conservative enough they are the point here is that you know we have we have to acknowledge we have to recognize and we have to accept and acknowledge you know not us not us as indians but the entire world you know the international community the, the during the cold war period we are the ones who has who have enabled this uh, entity called Taliban. Earlier they were called Mujahideen and now Taliban. And uh, if, if I can rejig your memory, and uh, in, the, in the University of Nebraska in Omaha, the Americans spent millions of dollars to produce books on jihad. Jihad was coarser then. Jihad was very much acceptable at that point of time. So we should not be hypocritical. In politics, it is very easy to be hypocritical. But here, when we are studying social phenomena, we have to recognize that whatever Afghanistan is today, it is because of our wrongdoing. The free world wanted to defeat the communist world and used Islam and Jihad as a weapon. And, and they did nothing about reversing that tide. In 89, the Americans happily went back without you know, bothering to think about the repercussions in the years to come. And here are we. Today, the same Americans have bitten the dust. I would say that, you know, many people are saying that Americans, you know, had their own uh, options, uh, their, they had their own regions. I would say that they have been defeated, summarily defeated. And the, uh, the Taliban uh, have emerged victorious. So, in a country like Afghanistan, the Taliban do enjoy the kind of legitimacy that any democratic government elsewhere enjoys. Because they are the Pashtun majority, they want them. Of course, we do not have any, uh, what, what do you say, credible uh, scale to determine whether, you know, the majority are in support of them, but they have a substantial uh, number of uh, people with them, which have brought them into power. Otherwise, you know, things would not have melted away the way, the way they did. And we had uh, in, um, return of Taliban uh, like this. And the Karzai's admission day before yesterday, which came out in newspapers, reveals even, even, even very, very closely that, you know, the system that was put in place by the Americans, it just melted away. They just had to run. They were on the run when the Taliban came in. So now, let us now think about the options for future. What we need to do, what can be done. I would imagine that at the moment, Afghanistan is at a crossroad because you have multiple countries bordering Afghanistan looking at Afghanistan in multiple ways and basically from the point of view of their own national interests and they do, they have nothing to uh, nothing they are not seriously thinking about how Afghanistan should step up in future you know they apart from making some statements and earlier the a slogan was, you know, Afghan, Afghan late and Afghan won system we will have in Afghanistan. Today we are uh, again and again reiterating that there should be an inclusive system in Afghanistan. The point is how to enable it. It cannot be enabled uh, so motto. We have to work towards it. And you cannot do it only through sanctions. This is my own, uh, what do you say, realization. That you have sanctioned North Korea for too long. You had sanctioned Cuba for too long. Did it change the mindset? It didn't. So you have to find, we have to find a way of both engaging and pressurizing the Taliban to undertake measures that will perhaps make them more acceptable to us. But for that, my, I, will, <clears throat> I think I have had my time. Uh, the, for that, we have to ensure that there is uh, similarity in thinking as far as countries which have influence on Afghanistan to help Afghanistan safe in a particular way. If you look at Iran, if you look at Russia, if you look at China, if you look at others, you find out that you know these these countries they have they are approaching Afghanistan from their own standpoint. There is no consensus on how to take Afghanistan forward. Uh, uh, realistically speaking, why should they? But 
the fact that they are engaged, they're engaging Afghanistan, even Turkey. Turkey is also engaged in Afghanistan. There has to be a constructive dialogue. We have to keep our uh, bilateral biases, bilateral prejudices, bilateral differences aside while doing it. Uh, if, 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 if we do not sum this, then things will be uh, much worse. We organized a regional conference of NSAs. The Pakistan and Pakistani and the Chinese delegates didn't come. So that 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 has to be sung. I think there has to be an effort where there will be consensus, external consensus to build up. And that will act as a pressure point on Taliban perhaps to be here, perhaps to bring in uh, changes in it, their perspective. Uh, Professor Behra was right that you know today in the government uh, out of 53 ministers, you have only 10 who can be taken as, uh, what do you say, minorities. That they're from their Uzbeks, Hazaras, Turkmen's and Tajiks. Uh, but most of them were either affiliated to Taliban earlier or are now affiliated to Taliban now. So these are the groups that only 10 out of 53 is not a good number. So you ha we have to keep that pressure up in a very, very persuasive manner rather than sanctioning them for all, the, all time to come. The second is, I would say, the consensus within. This is the consensus without. Without, con uh, without that, there will not be uh, enough uh, progress uh, in Afghanistan. The consensus within would require Taliban to work with other minority cousins. The Pashtuns are there, they're, 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 they're perhaps more than, little more than 50% of the population of Afghanistan, but the rest, will have to be taken in, taken into account. They will have to be talked to. And that also an internal dialogue, how best that can be enabled. And whether, you know, external pressure can help uh, Afghanistan do, uh, Taliban do that, or any other method in which it can be done. That has to be also answered so that Afghanistan also doesn't suffer from within, that there is no infighting, no civil war. Only then perhaps we can uh, look at a more peaceful and more acceptable Afghanistan in future. I will stop here. Maybe in the Q and A we can talk about it more. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ashok. Uh, I'm I'm looking at the Q and A. I will ask uh, uh, Mr. Vishal just after this. Uh, first, I will pose one question. Then I will request Vishal. You can you know just make make any question to any of the panelists. But I would like to ask. Uh, Mr. Mahindra Way, the question. Uh, as we are aware, uh, the western end of Afghanistan, Herat kept changing hands, but it was only in 1863 that Herat was wrenched from the clutches of Persia and uh, became a formal part of Afghanistan. The southern border, many panelists have had a word about the Duran line and the fact that the Pashtuns are on both sides. I'd like to ask about the northern border. As you are aware, it is 1884 to 1886. A joint boundary commission between the British Empire and the Russian Empire for two years did a survey, and uh, we can call it the Ridgeway Line because Joseph West Ridgeway, who was a British civil servant, randomly drew this line, which was more of an adjustment between the Russian Empire and the British Empire for control over these territories rather than anything to do with the ethnic, cultural, and historical linkages which people had. And that is the reason um, I can just conjecture why you have so many Uzbeks, Tajik, etc. in Afghanistan, whereas uh, this line which was drawn with the Amudarya and the various other things. So uh, I'd like you to shed some light on this and whether the Taliban will be able to incorporate these ethnic uh, minorities or will we see them again, you know, having some kind of a turmoil on this line. So I will first ask you to answer answer this question. In the meantime, uh, next will be Vishal. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, General Bakshi. Uh, well, as we all know, Great Cave was all about that, uh, you know, the rivalry between the British Empire and the Russian Empire. And somewhere the Durer line came and uh, the whole history of it, uh, at least uh, 250 years. 
And uh, what you have now in Afghanistan is a uh, one estimate is that Pashtuns, they form, they are the single largest, but not the majority. Now, Uzbeks, Bazaras, and uh, uh, Tajiks, the other groups are significant minorities. And uh, they have lived, uh, you know, basically in the north. The question is, they have not been able to, there has been no uh, amalgamation, no kind of integration of these people. They have lived where they have found themselves comfortable. And the reason that uh, uh, junior Ahmed Basud is uh, able to try it, didn't go very far in uh, having a, trying a campaign in Panjshir Valley. The thing is that Afghanistan, as I briefly mentioned, was that it's a very, fairly inward looking society. And uh, they have not been able to integrate these people. Now, as you know, uh, they're of Turkic regime. And uh, whatever Persian element they have in Tajikistan has made it even more difficult for them. And also, uh, problems have been also between Shias and Sunnis. I remember when the earlier when the Mujahideen fight was going on, anti-Russia, anti-Soviet. And there were fighters who regretted uh, a massacre, not because they were, uh, because, not because of the, but because they were Shias. They thought they ended up fighting, fellow killing fellow Muslims. So even the Shia Sunni equation is also there. There is another region where Shia, wherever they are in Herat and other region, and even central part, they have not been able to integrate beyond the point. All right, thank you. Uh, so now, Mr. Vishal, would you like to uh, make a few comments or a question? So I would like to uh, ask all the four panelists and uh, and if they can respond, I think that would add to our knowledge a lot because uh, there's one issue which hasn't really been discussed. I think uh, we need to, and uh, Dr. Behuria to an extent talk, I mean, all the panelists in a way uh, referred to it, but they couldn't uh, uh, come out with uh, suggestions as to what would it take for the Taliban to get down to the basics of governance and uh, economy. I think that is what we are looking for, uh, particularly in this session. So what could be the way forward in terms of make, well, Taliban are a reality as, as we have been told, but uh, what should be the way forward in terms of encouraging them to get down to the basics of governance and economy? So I, I would request all the four panelists if they can share their views and perceptions on uh, this question. Thank you on this issue. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, at this point, I will ask only Dr. Behera to answer this one. The others may keep noting it and I will come to a final round later. But after Dr. Behera answers, I will ask uh, Dr. Smuti, Dr. Anand and Dr. Dr. Gulbin to make their, their questions and then we will have one last round for all the panelists to answer the questions. So first, Dr. Behera, can you answer this one? Uh, okay, uh, uh, thank you Vishal for that uh, uh, question. Um, actually, uh, you know, this is this is probably the most difficult question. That's why I think, you know, everyone had a lot to say, uh, but probably it didn't have very, very specific answers to that uh, particular question. Uh, I also dealt with it, and I, I think I, I, I dealt with it in a very broad way. Uh, one of the things that I see, I mean, it, it still falls into my framework that that the Taliban regime is not going to see easy legitimization soon. Uh, despite what Ashok has just pointed out, and I think a, his position is very pragmatic, and I think he's got some amount of historical evidence also to kind of suggest uh, how you know the Taliban regime will eventually uh, get a legitimization. But on the other side, uh, uh, you know, if you if you see how uh, these things evolve, uh, you know that 
here is a here is a, 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 here is basically uh, an insurgent group uh, which has taken power now first of all they did not have a clear roadmap themselves as to what they going to do after they govern uh, now this you know the comparison has to be i don't know whether you know you can make a, a comparison with the pla but you can make a make a sort of comparison with other groups like the ltt and all in 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 sri lanka where they were also able to have uh, you know an insurgency going on for years now ideologically what did they stand for i mean what was the alternative they had to offer in case uh, they came into power or they had a separate state now the problem with the taliban is that it has not shown to us anything in terms of what kind of governance system they have except for you know talking about uh, an islamic regime uh, you do not know what is it i mean is it the same state structure that you take over and you make it function function but the problem is that here is an islamic republic how does it become an islamic emirate uh, that's one fundamental question is that you know what are the governance structures that need to need, need to change under the taliban i have my doubts whether the taliban itself is clear about that you know you basically take over and then one of the biggest problems that that they going to face is the short term uh, in the long term how that they going to handle that is something we have to wait and watch is the fact that you know most of the people want to leave that country and what they have lost in that many of people who left the country was essentially a large chunk of cream of people educated the skilled uh, who have left the country uh, now how do you replace them how do you bring in governance structures i mean the taliban does not have a support base which can take over power and start ruling which is what probably you know many other insurgent groups could do uh where they took over power and then they could find the replacements to take over the structures and uh, whatever you know a centralized or authoritarian system you could run it now here here we have questions which we do not clearly have you know facts on the ground to tell us as to how they going to do it uh in regard to the economy my sense is uh, that we are going to see a kind of a war economy when i say a war economy what i mean is essentially how people adapt to a conflict uh, zone or how people adapt to a con conflict uh, economy meaning that uh, you know you essentially in a conflict zone in which people will find mean mechanisms of surviving because people will have to find livelihoods so many i mean if you read some of these stories coming out from afghanistan people having lost jobs uh, people having locked out in the economy uh now all those people will start finding some way of adapting to the new reality they will have to find livelihood or you know i mean the poverty levels better going to go up and to what extent the international community or uh, you know is going to support or the united nations is going to support uh to in in terms of humanitarian assistance uh i mean i do not think you know that's going to be uh, sufficient eventually there will have to be some kind of internal mechanism and this is a dynamic process it is not a process which you can completely control in the dynamic process you will find some structures which will evolve to adapt to the new reality the new reality in which uh, you know money flow has kind of suddenly gone down the economy is not functioning um, the taliban doesn't have the resources investments are not going to come in easily even if chinese investments come in it's not going to chinese are going to invest in areas where they can get returns they're not going to invest uh, you know with the with the taliban regime so i i you know the 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 the, the taliban in my sense uh, you know had an assumption that once you take over power uh, it's almost like a fait accompli the international community does not have any option but to accept that reality and deal with them uh, they were i think taken by surprise to a certain extent of the kind of reaction which came and the stopping of uh, you know their reserves uh, uh, you know the 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 slowly the international community is going to come in 
So one option, my last point, uh, Major Bakshi, is uh, that um, the international community might start, uh, you know, dealing with the people rather than with the Taliban. I mean, one of the points that which you know I was trying to make and which probably did not come across is <clears throat> that we have to deal with the Taliban. It's not that as if the uh, the question of legitimacy me means that we just, uh, you know, we have to recognize them to deal with them. Uh, you can still deal with the country because you probably don't have a choice. And therefore, you know, the national community is going to deal with the Taliban uh, without giving it leg legitimacy, without recognizing, uh, recognizing the Tal Taliban as a legitimate government. And that's still a possibility, reality, which does open up options for you to try and do something. Uh, that I'm not too clear as to what are the options that that the international community can think of? Uh, thank you. I'll stop. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, I now request Dr. Smriti. You want to raise a question or a comment? Yeah, I just have uh, one question that all of us were speaking about uh, legitimization of Taliban. But uh, none of you spoke about how Taliban is going to get legitimized because, uh, of course, they do not accept democracy. And uh, therefore, the election process of election is ruled out. And uh, I, I can only see a lawyer, Jirka, probably can be uh, called uh, for the legitimization process. But, uh, uh, you know, one doesn't know that uh, what does one mean by legitimacy because if you have captured the power, and have the majority Pashtun support. I'm just making an assumption. I, I'm, I'm really clear that not all the Pashtun support the Taliban, but uh, they have a majority kind of support or by coercion or maybe by willingness. It's very difficult to know. So what is the process of legitimization of Taliban, which will be acceptable to the international community? That's my question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Anand. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, my question is actually linked to what we heard uh, last evening and uh, what we heard today afternoon. Uh, yesterday we heard uh, Michael Kugelman saying that US is driving in Afghanistan looking in rear view mirror. So essentially uh, what we were saying is that US wants now to get out of Afghanistan and they have done it. Uh, it appears to me that they decided first to get out of Afghanistan, then uh, they discovered increased competition with China as a bigger threat. Uh, then today we heard that uh, uh, from Professor Raja Mohan uh, uh, when he was talking about two choices uh, Taliban can make. He was talking about uh, uh, either a uh, Taliban can look to China or uh, China and Russia, or it can look to uh, US and Western world and uh, perhaps countries in the neighborhood. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so if uh, actually uh, my uh, uh, question or comment uh, uh, is uh, this, that uh, uh, I won't be surprised if US, is want, uh, US wanted to get out of uh, Afghanistan then uh, it, it, it is not surprising that uh, the Taliban leans towards China. Perhaps US would not be uh, unhappy if they draw in China or Russia. But the big question is whether China or Russia would be willing to get into Afghanistan. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, may I uh, ask Dr. Raja Mohan, Professor Raja Mohan, if you could take on these last two questions, then there are some in the chat box, and then I will turn to Gulbin. Thank you. Thank you. Before that, I'm seeing uh, Mr. Wade is raising his hand. So, would you like to intervene, uh, Mr. Wade? Uh, you're muted. You're muted. This on the economy part, I would like to uh, start with a caution. Uh, Taliban have used drug money in the past to gather arms and it's fueled the campaign in a very big way. In any case, even without them, drug has been a very big factor in, in Afghan economy. And uh, whether or not they get enough money, what will be the role of this drug economy and uh, how the international community is going to you know, 
same really at the same time guard against uh, misuse of the drug money. Number one, number two, uh, the China part. The China is very reportedly very keen to extend the CPEC into Afghanistan. May not be directly, maybe parallelly, but a broad uh, aim would be the same. And that is where uh, you know how far Chinese and Pakistani interests converge in Afghanistan, and how far China's interest in Afghanistan clashes with Pakistan's interest. These are some of the issues that need to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I turn to Professor Rajmohan, please, uh, with these questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, the number of uh, good questions, uh, but I'll, I'll just respond to the last uh, two or three. Uh, one, uh, there was a question from Vishal. I mean, uh, how do we get, how do you encourage Taliban to move towards good governance? In my humble view, really, that is not a question for us. Uh, what is the principal concern for us? I mean, that for us at this point, for the Indian strategic community, the question is to understand where, how the internal contradictions play out and how uh, the, the new developments will play themselves out and how do we protect ourselves. But it is the Americans and the best who really talk about, you know, producing internal change that is positive. Now, our own experience tells us uh, that we can convince Colombo about the virtues of federalism after the Indian Army went in and made those great sacrifices. So this idea somehow the world can persuade, uh, you know, Taliban to behave well and become good government. But let's look, they have agency of their own. Like Colombo has had agency of their own. They were not going to listen to anyone despite all the pressures we put on them. So, so I think we got to be, you know, what should be our focus at this point of time? Our focus should be to understand the structural change how it plays out and what do we do to protect uh, our interest. This is a very simplest, simple and not this ambitious thing of saying uh, what actually happens to Taliban. Look, that is something we got to see. Now, here again, we got to distinguish between the diplomatic posturing that all governments do, including in Delhi, and the strategic questions and the, and the longer term questions, because look, uh, all inclusive government. Nice thing to say, yeah, but are you going to bet your money this is going to happen in the next few days, next few years? Or Taliban should respect the rights of minority of women. Fine. This is like the you know, lion should lie down with the lamb, but but you don't have the capacity to force it. If you had the capacity to do it, 20 years, five trillion dollars, 150,000 American troops at the peak, they couldn't deliver it. The idea that a UN resolution can produce that, I, I think it is uh, unrealistic. I, I'm not saying those are not important issues uh, for the activists, for civil society groups. But those of us who are sitting in the Institute of Defense, for us, the question is, where is the structural contradiction? And how do they, how do they play out? Uh, and, and what are the kind of internal contradictions within Afghanistan, between Afghanistan and Pakistan, between Afghanistan and Iran? Uh, what do we, how do we play in that realm and what are the options that we have? The principal objective being to protect our interests. Whether the Taliban is good or bad, it's a secondary thing. I mean, there will be consequences of how they behave. Uh, so we should, we should focus on what is more uh, doable for us rather than uh, going into the very fundamental questions about the nature of the Taliban. I think the legitimacy question too is similar. Look, this idea because they didn't have elections, they're not going to be legitimate. What has China said? I mean, just look at what Chinese have said in the last uh, three months since August. The Western standards should not be imposed on Taliban. So you see, look, they're, you know, they're different. You can't do this. So that's part of a nice ideological argument China has. So they don't frame it as legitimizing the Taliban. They say, look, there's a new power there. We need to do it. And they need development. Let me go in and help them develop. What are the Europeans saying? Europeans are saying, look, humanitarian aid is urgent thing. Let's go give aid irrespective of other things. So that should be separated. Women's rights should be separated from delivering humanitarian assistance. So these are the kind of wretched, hard choices that happen in the real world. And, and I think they're... The question of legitimacy of the Taliban is lost. I mean, I think the Russians and the Chinese are very close to accepting the legitimacy of the government and ready to business with it. Uh, and the question is whether they do it formally under the guise of a new, nobody cares for UN resolutions, as we all know. Uh, that is a way of framing a position. Uh, but each one of them, if you go back to the actual negotiating record in that, I mean, there were different positions. 
As for my senses, uh, legitimacy is not something important for us. But for us, the question should be again the strategic questions about durability of the regime, how it's going to behave, uh, and what is it there for India. For example, why did India send medical assistance? After all, the two flights went. Uh, just a few months ago, we think Taliban was untouchable, right? No, they're reaching out to India. Saying, look, we want you, can, can please help us. They were willing to put pressure on the Pakistan government, which has refused to give any transit to India. Imran Khan greatly said, look, I won't trade with India till on this, you know, you know, as long as Kashmir issue is not solved. He's been under pressure from Taliban saying, look, how can you stop food aid for us? Now, whether actual terms of trucks and who gets to transport it, all that is there. But the fact is, it's interesting that the Taliban has forced Pakistan to do something which Pakistan was unwilling to do in any situation in the last 70 years. So, so I think there are going to be a lot more twists and turns in the way Taliban is going to behave. And I think for us is to be able to see those pressures and uh, how they actually uh, play out uh, rather than focusing on the normative questions. I mean, this way the American debate gets played out in the public domain. They think time is the discourses uh, and the Europeans do the same, but actual policy doesn't go by these uh, think tank formulations, but on the question of their interests, well, everyone will frame it in the best in ideological terms, but the actual operation uh, will be uh, on a whole. Uh, if the Taliban promises uh, the US government that will not make any attacks, that will respect the deal with uh, the army Khalilzad, uh, you'll see the change that will take place in, in the US itself. Uh, so, so I think there are a lot of possibilities, and I think we've got to be cynical at this point, recognize the world is cynical in how it deals with bad regimes. If you have a problem, there's one way you frame it. If you have a gains, you frame it in another way. So don't take the abstract propositions uh, on, on, on their own. Uh, similarly, the, I think the, the question by Anand Kumar on uh, Taliban and its choices, it's not that, look, there is this theory that, look, Americans don't mind if the Russians and Chinese, Chinese get sucked into Afghanistan. Look, that is a way of justifying the withdrawal. But the fact is, how far China will go, which is the point the DG raised. They're cautious. But will there be a change in Afghanistan? From all that they've said, for example, on the Uyghur question, Taliban said, look, we're not going to interfere in China's internal affairs. Chinese said, we're going to give assistance. So we got to see that, how that actually plays out between Taliban and, and China, with mediated by, by Pakistan. So I think those issues are what matter, and not get into this very abstract, very high level, very macro uh, framing of issues. Uh, I think uh, we need them to, to pass the potential pathways, but not to focus on the on the on the on the normative normative question. Finally, one I think about what General Bakshi raised about the northern borders. It's a very interesting question. I mean, will Bakan corridor survive? What is the deal between the subcontinent, the British Raj, and and the Russians? Now, Chinese were a weak state then. The Chinese are today a force. So what happens is now already they talk about the Talib, uh, China has set up some. Uh, stations are building a base north of Wakhan corridor. They're going to help the Tajiks uh, to deal with the situation. And the Tajiks and the Afghan contra Taliban contradiction is out in the open. Uh, they're the only ones in the Central Asian states who have taken a very strong position against uh, against the Taliban. Whether that is part of the Russian game of uh, having two lines, or is it actually a policy? That that's something uh, we we got to see. So the the rise of the Chinese power, what does it do to the historic arrangement? That were there in the subcontinent. I think the Wakhan corridor question, I think it'll be very good. I mean, there have a lot of speculation about a base. Tajik said, no, there is no base. We are building something. The Chinese are helping us. But I would say there was a talk about security forces being deployed on the Tajik Afghan border by the Chinese to monitor the drug movement. And that again is an interesting development that, that has to be watched. Uh, so, so I think there are a lot of developments. Similarly, the northern frontier of Kashmir, we don't talk about, we talked about the Shakshkan Valley. But on the other side, actually, 1947, the nationalist government of China was negotiating with uh, the, the Gilgit Baltistan people saying, look, partition has given you two choices, but you're happy to join us if you're interested. Uh, we'll be quite happy to take you. And that border is not settled. Let's be clear, the northern border with Pakistan and China is not settled. That was supposed to be pending India-Pakistan resolution Kashmir dispute. But if Chinese power continues to rise, they're going to put uh, already, in a sense, their economic presence in the northern Kashmir, I mean, let's tra transform that region. So, so I think there nothing is permanent. Uh, 
whether it changes in terms of actual lines on the ground or whether it changes in terms of economic influence. Who has the primary say in this undefined areas uh, between Kashmir, Afghanistan and uh, Afghanistan uh, and, uh, and the Central Asia will be very, very interesting. Those are the kind of questions I hope ideas said will enlighten the rest of us in the uh, in the region. I'll stop. Uh, have you finished, sir? Have you uh, answered what Dr. Smriti also asked? About legitimacy, I said, look, uh, legitimacy is a very vague notion. I, mean, I think as the Chinese and Russians are close to legitimizing it already. They don't want to go by book saying, oh, have you held the elections? Were the elections held properly? Were the votes counted? But I think it's really, you know, <laughs> their interests meet dealing with Taliban. They're going to deal with it. Right now, they're not doing it. But operationally, they're already doing quite a bit. Uh, similarly, on the question of uh, changing their behavior, we can't change Pakistan to think smartly about their economic uh, policies. So this idea, I think we should be, we should be, you know, recognize the limits of what we can do and where we should focus on, rather than getting trapped in the in the discussion on legitimacy, good governance. Those issues are important, uh, but but that's not where the moment is going to be. Thank you, sir. Uh... All the panelists may please, uh, you know, keep a note of their comments on the other panelists' comments too. When I come down for the final round, uh, so now there are some questions popping up in the Q and A box. So Mr. Mir Nazir has, is asking uh, from Professor Bera, is a, it is difficult for the Taliban to legitimize their rule? But I will ask Dr. Ashok to answer this because I think uh, Professor Bera has already answered a kind of similar question. So uh, Mir Nazir has said it is difficult for the Taliban to legitimize their rule. But at the same time, the US supported regimes also failed to create a legitimacy that could have survived the onslaught of the 70,000 insurgents. What do you think can help in creating a balance between the three Taliban, non Taliban, and external actors? Dr. Ashok. Or did you hear that, Dr. Ashok? Yeah, uh, you are muted. You are muted. Uh, the question is, I'm just reading it out. It is difficult for Taliban to legitimize the rule, but at the same time, the U.S. supported regimes also failed to create a legitimacy that could have survived on sort of seventy thousand. What could? What do you think can help in creating a balance between the three? The Taliban, the non-Taliban, and the external actors. I think you know it's, it's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, in fact, uh, I would say uh, whether there was a balance or not, that question uh, is over now. Now that the Taliban have come to power, uh, I don't think the balance can be restored now. We can go back and uh, you know fend off the Taliban. So I I, I don't think we should uh, think it think that way. Whether we are thinking in terms of resisting the Taliban even today, delegitimizing them and throwing them out, that that, that is something that we need to explore. But uh, as uh, it was pointed out earlier, I think we have to be realistic. You know, they are there; they're there to stay now. And we have seen, you know, Americans telling us that we are looking at Afghanistan in our rear rear view mirror. Yesterday, that is what uh, Michael Kugelman told us. That you know, don't have any uh, delusions. Americans are not getting back to Afghanistan again Un until and unless there is an attack on the homeland, which we can attribute to Afghanistan. So, in that sense, things have moved away from uh, the the question that you have posed. Uh, and in terms of the external actors, I think uh, Professor Rajamon is right, and I was also pointing out the same thing. We are all approaching Afghanistan from our own realist, uh, own interest uh, vantage point in the, from the point of view of our interest. And uh, uh, Professor Rajamon said that we should be only thinking about uh, those options which will serve our interest. And if all the countries in the region with their own historical legacies and the issues with our, their neighbors who also have an interest in Afghanistan are, are looking at their own interests, then you know what kind of situation we are getting into. So in that sense, it is it is just like saying that we are being indifferent to Afghanistan in a way, like we are not being uh, concerned about the kind of uh, reality that is stepping up in Afghanistan. 
so the my take was that you know we should try to uh, develop a consensus which is also very difficult you know i am i'm being idealistic here which can perhaps force pakistan force um, uh, taliban to behave in a particular way like adil has uh, asked a question very interesting question that swell sahin has welcomed indian help and the nsa level dialogue was also uh, welcomed by swell sahin with the spokesperson of taliban Jabiullah Mujahid also has come out and said in several occasions that we want the Indians to also come in and help us. So what makes them say so? So I can only tell you that, you know, many people based on such observations have uh, come out with uh, views that this is Taliban 2.0. This is not 1.0. There are others from Afghanistan who have told me that don't think it is 2.0. It is somewhere between 1.0 and 2.0. And they are still the same Taliban. So perhaps they are being projecting themselves as pragmatic. Uh, I would, uh, uh, you know, I, I think at the at the at the um, level of uh, the NSA and the government, I think there is uh, uh, enough cogitation taking place to take the process of engagement forward, maybe in a very guarded way, in a very cautious manner. That is how we sent in uh, fifty. Thousand metric ton of wet, and also sent in medicines. So we have expressed our desire also to be part of the reconstruction and development process. We have already buried about three billion dollars out there. So that's the way forward. I think we should keep doing it, but at the same time, I think this engagement may also, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, moderate uh, the Taliban overtures. But we must recognize that the moderate forces who uh, uh, dealt with uh, the US, who negotiated with the US, uh, now form the B team of Taliban. And whether they will have as much impact, as much effect, that remains to be seen. I'll stop here. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, so, so while I have you on the floor, I'll, I'll request you also to answer Zainab's question, which says that the TDP has unilaterally called off the month long ceasefire with the government of Pakistan that was mediated by the Afghan Taliban. Will this have any impact on the future of the peace talks? I think to understand TTP, I must uh, front load myself and sell my book here. <laughs> One has to read my book, which is available free. It is freely downloadable from my DSA website, uh, where I have uh, talked about, you know, what kind of a creature it is. You know, if you look at uh, the Taliban literature, TTP literature, not Taliban literature, TTA and TTP, People say they are Siamese twins. They are, you know, joined at the hip. Uh, I would say that, you know, they have gone beyond that. Perhaps, you know, they are not no longer joined at the hip. They have gone beyond TTA and they have taken their leap forward in the direction of uh, AQIS and ISK. And if you look at their literature, they say that this Pakistan army is Murtad. They are Wajibul Katal. They don't deserve to be where they are today. So they are, they continue with their fight against the Pakistan army. So I knew it. In fact, if you uh, remember in one of the one day morning meetings, I had I identified this, that maybe TTA and especially the Hakani group is trying to mediate between Pakistani army and Pakistani state and the TTP. But the TTP is a conglomerate of about 30 plus uh, different groups. And they may be reaching out to people who would be available to their influence, uh, but I don't find any reason to hope that you know those who have summarily uh, alleged the Pakistan army to be heretical and to be anti-Islam to be uh, what do you say uh, coming under their persuasion. So TTA's success in Afghanistan has really emboldened them. That is what Parvez Woodboy told us in the morning. So in that sense. This rejection of ceasefire is doesn't surprise me, but I also uh, uh, had said, and I am reiterating now that I will not be surprised if tomorrow the Pakistan army through TTA and others, you know, tries to divert their attention towards India. And I don't, I don't know whether it is going to happen, but even then there will be elements who would continue to fight the Pakistani state and particularly the Pakistan army. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashok. Um, 
before I wind up uh, with our scholars, I will turn to Gulbin. Uh, yeah, Gulbin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, uh, thank you all the panelists for uh, sharing their views and enlightening us. My question is to Professor Raja Mohan. Um, so I agree with your point that it is not our business to um, uh, ask Taliban how to behave. But uh, while I agree with your point, I would also like to draw your attention to one of the points uh, made by one of the panelists in the previous session, the third session, where uh, he said that um, uh, the dilemma probably all the countries are having is how to address the concerns of the common uh, Afghans bypassing the Taliban. So, uh, so, so uh, if we are, it's not our business to ask Taliban how to behave and all, how can, how can we uh, address, or the international community, I'm not talking about a particular country, but international community address the concerns uh, the common Afghan people have, for example, women rights and other human rights issues. Your views, sir, thank you. Uh, yeah, so may I ask uh, uh, one of the panelists would like to take this on? Can I come in? Uh, yes, please. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's not. Uh, how do we look? I, I think uh, we, that's what you got to look at the declaratory side of positions that the governments take to actual policy behavior of, of governments. I mean, I think as analytical communities, our focus should be constantly to separate the focus on the formal diplomatic and the UN resolution kind to actually what the states are, are, are doing. Uh, tell me if the question of uh, India did send uh, medical supplies right to, to Afghanistan without asking any questions. So there you put the humanitarian interests ahead of all the other considerations, which is what Europe wants to do. But Europe is still setting conditions and saying, oh, we want uh, you know to be delivered directly. We, we also say it some days. Um, but the fact is that there is some connect. They've reached out to us and they say, look, oh, we'll do your favor. We'll send you this. That doesn't mean the diplomatic position has fully changed. So that you are at the beginning of a, of a negotiating process with, with Taliban. So let's let's be honest with ourselves. What is India's core interest in Afghanistan? It is that no terrorism comes out of Afghanistan, that Afghanistan does not become a reservoir for Pakistan's support to terrorism against India. All the rest are secondary, whether it is a coalition government, inclusive government, uh, respect for rights of minorities. We, we like all those things. The whole world likes it. But every country has a set of interests that it is going to deal with. But China guarantees on we could Xinjiang security is the principal consideration. And for them, battle against the American influence is a secondary consideration. That has moved them much closer to the, uh, the actual action. Then we are just tentatively probing what is there between us uh, to, to see where we go. So, so I think we should not conflate your core interests with the general proposition of what we would like to see in a what ought to be in Afghanistan is different from what is likely to be. And the governments know it, even when they say it, they sit down and say these things. Sometimes it's used for pressure. Sometimes it's used to actually deflect attention from other interests. But more fundamentally, states are going to uh, deal with, uh, uh, with their own interests. And I think that's why we got to keep an eye on that. And how Russia, what does Russia say? Drug problem is the main thing. Therefore, we got to deal with the Taliban. Having a supporting the Taliban is good to fight ISK. That's the Russian argument. So they, they're going to be driven by the government by without seeming to violate the UN resolution. They're going to keep doing that. And for India too, an assurance that the Taliban will be an independent actor from Pakistan would be far more consequential than how exactly their constitutional virtues are going to play themselves out. So I would say, look, Close, follow very closely what's happening between Delhi and Kabul. This is not the catechism that India had in the last 20 years. It's very different. And I think, and some of you pointed out to the various statements of Sultan Shahi, but for them too, you know, they want to connect. They want to break their isolation. They don't want to be too dependent on Pakistan. That is their primary interest. They, they don't want to be obliged to Pakistan forever. Nobody is ever grateful to another country. So I think, how far will they go? And what are the competing factions within them? We don't know. Afghani network might have one view. 
the Kandahari Taliban have another view. There are all kinds of factions within them. So I think for them too, they would want to see who else can play with them. So it could be just a tease to test out India. Can you back us? It's not a formal commitment that they'll be nice to us. But at this point, we are exploring what are the possibilities. And similarly, Russians and the Chinese are doing a lot more. Tomorrow, the Americans will do it. So, so my sense is that's what we got to track rather than merely saying, you know, the, the newspaper headlines are one thing, but for us, analytically, it's far more important to look at the structural issues rather than uh, what's happening on a daily basis, what the governments are saying uh, in public. Uh, that's really important, but, but that's not the uh, main uh, main uh, moving force. But but I would say watch out for the Taliban statements. In fact, some of their uh, hostility to Pakistan, some of their spokesmen has been quite visceral. Uh, the way they talk about TTA, uh, you know, be your guest, talk to them. It, it tells you there is there are interesting issues and the fact that as i mentioned twice they put pressure on pakistan to open the doors to deliver the aid the aid has not been delivered we're still negotiating with pakistan the food aid 50 million tons but, but that's uh, 50000 tons i mean so so i think it will be interesting positions from the taliban they have not settled up they not clarified which exact direction they'll go but i think that's what uh, our job as analysts in the next week, weeks and months would be to track that potential likely evolution rather than looking at it in a normative thank you for that sir uh, there's one more question uh, by mr manzoor ahmed uh, if taliban ruled afghanistan takes a chinese capital route to ensure its economic development that would lead to chinese dominance in afghanistan do you think the american grand strategy will easily accept it given the history of great power competition in the region i request uh, Professor Behra to take this and also Professor Behra give your concluding remarks for a minute or two after this. Along with this question, would you, would you like, me, uh, like me to repeat the question? Or can you see it in the Q&A box by Mr. Manzoor Ahmed? No, I, I can't see the question in the Q&A okay, box. I will, just repeat, uh, I will just request you to repeat the beginning of the question. Yeah. The question is that if Taliban ruled Afghanistan takes the Chinese capital route, which has been discussed about the extension of the CPEC and uh, uh, words to that effect, uh, it would ultimately lead to Chinese domination in that region. And do you think this would be acceptable in the American grand strategy? So uh, this is the question and also any other concluding remarks uh, uh, over the next two, three minutes, please. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I think the, 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 the question about uh, Chinese involvement and, uh, you know, Chinese capital. Uh, first, I don't think so either, you know, China or Russia are going to get involved in Afghanistan, uh, you know, the way the United States got involved. So I think that that's very clear. Uh, so there's no question of, you know, the U.S. thinking that they're going to entice these two countries uh, to China. Uh, second is about Chinese capital. I mean, certainly, I mean, it's it, it's uh, kind of uh, tempting uh, to uh, bring in the uh, CPEC. But one thing I think the Chinese are getting wary about with all the investments in the uh, CPEC and, 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 and BRI is the capacity of uh, some of these countries for, uh, you know, uh, giving back the returns. I mean, the debt trap while uh, you know the countries have a problem in the increasing debt trap uh, but the fact is the chinese still have to uh, get back the return uh, so there is uh, disquiet about the cpec itself so while there has been a discussion in the media that the chinese uh, you know want to extend the cpec to afghanistan uh, i i mean i i don't think so the experience also with the uh, <clears throat> mines and all has uh, kind of uh, uh, worked well so far. Uh, one more issue is about the security situation. Uh, and that's something which obviously has changed. I mean, this is something which may not have been contemplated uh, earlier. Uh, but in the contemporary situation, the Chinese might feel a little more uh, secure that <clears throat> the Taliban can give them assurances. Uh, but still, I think economic sense, uh, if economic sense prevails, uh, the Chinese will not be in a hurry to uh, extend the CPEC and therefore, you know, that kind of capital domination uh, of Afghanistan by the Chinese 
uh, is going to work out. So that <clears throat> that's my uh, kind of assessment. But you know, the Chinese might do something else, which we'll have to uh, wait and see. Uh, final point uh, regarding this whole question of legitimacy, which has come up uh, several times. Uh, I think uh, uh, by the end of it, I think some normative concerns will have to be there. I mean, uh, we, I mean, while countries are being very pragmatic, and I can see uh, many countries uh, have been far more pragmatic than India has been. Um, <clears throat> And that's why what we see is countries like Russia are able to uh, continue engaging the Taliban even while they consider the Taliban as a terrorist organization. Uh, so, I mean, there's some lessons for India in that, that uh, it's not necessary that we have to recognize the regime. Uh, we have to deal with them. And uh, whatever back channel talks have happened, uh, the uh, issues about, you know, uh, trying to give them medical aid or food aid. Uh, I think these are important because uh, India has had that image within Afghanistan that it has actually done a lot for the Afghan people. And that, I think, is something that India needs to continue to do that. And the challenge is that how you do it, whether through the Taliban or bypassing the Taliban. Actually, I would I would say that, you know, you have to uh, engage with the Taliban, that does not mean uh, that tomorrow we have to recognize them. Uh, what I, of course, will not be able to say is that opening up diplomatic relations again with the Taliban regime, does it amount to recognition of the regime or not? Is, is, it, is there a possibility of uh, opening up diplomatic engagement and still not recognize the regime, uh, which many countries are doing? I think there's there are some options here to uh, play around. I mean, why would we want to legitimize the Taliban government immediately? It, it uh, let's wait and watch, and yet we have to do our bit uh, for the people of Afghanistan, and 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 that that's a fairly pragmatic position that uh, we can take on that issue. Uh, let me stop there, General Bakshi. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very nice, uh, Mr. Ved. I will ask you uh, to uh, give your concluding remarks and also. Touch upon what already Dr. Ashok has touched upon Dr. Adil Rashid's question. The Taliban spokesman Sohel Rashid Shaheen is on record welcoming India NSA's seven nation conference, even though it was not invited, uh, nor was Pakistan, uh, nor did Pakistan attend. What could have been the reason for Taliban welcoming the Indian seminar and its recommendations? And all the panelists who are left uh, could also mention, oh, what do you feel is Taliban's approach towards India? Uh, even that you could just Touch upon in your concluding remarks, Mr. Wade. Thank you. Thank you, General Bakshi. I think uh, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the question very clearly. Uh, so, uh, what I'm asking, and what Dr. Adil is asking, is what do you think is the Taliban's approach towards India since they have welcomed the recent seminar where our Indian NSA had a seven nation conference? So your voice is cracking. So you're on mute. Yeah, Sindhu, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can, yes. Uh, okay, if you can hear me, sir, over the next two minutes, just make your uh, concluding remarks, please. Well, uh, I think uh, we have a long way to go uh, dealing with uh, Taliban, but we need to do it and uh, be part of the process where we can uh, add to the development. And uh, it, it may not be easy because uh, much will depend on how the Taliban regime, particularly the Haqqanis, who have been proxies, and who have attacked Indian interests in the past, how they look at India's participation. Uh, things may have changed, things may not have changed. We don't know. We have to be extremely, extremely cautious. I do not see that happening in the next uh, uh, near future, unless we are very sure that our interests are guarded properly. Question is who will guard it? 
that this question was also raised in the context of Chinese investment. Who will guard it? Is it the Pakistan army? Is it the Chinese? Is it the Chinese own people, or is it the uh, new Taliban uh, forces? And uh, there, there is no uh, there is no uh, for, formal army uh, in, in power in Pakistan, in China, Afghanistan. So who will guard? It's not going to be easy for any one of us, even if the even the Russians. So we have to guard her. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ashok, would you like to make your, your concluding remarks? Thereafter, I'll request Professor uh, Rajamohan. He seems to have stepped away. When he comes back, I'll ask him to make his concluding remarks. Yeah, Dr. Ashok. Uh, I think I have uh, nothing much to add. Uh, I can only say that uh, the way ahead for us uh, is uh, uh, to engage uh, with Afghan people and uh, uh, we should not also have a very inflexible position on engaging uh, Af Taliban because uh, uh, Taliban are a reality in, in some ways. You know, in fact, we are basically looking at the international community's response to Taliban and uh, Pakistan, for example, they have engaged pa uh, uh, Afghan uh, Taliban. Russians have engaged Taliban, Iranians have engaged Taliban, China has engaged Taliban, none of them has yet recognized Taliban. So that that shows, you know, there is still some degree of reluctance in the minds of all these con countries not to uh, uh, recognize Taliban, but they keep engaging Taliban. So in addition to that, you know, we should also think in terms of reaching out to other minorities, other communities. Uh, with whom we had excellent relationship until uh, you know the Karzai administration came in, or the bond process kicked in. You know, after the bond process kicked in, our relationship with uh, the Northern Alliance members and the non-Pashtun minorities has fallen off. So we need to keep our track to option open. Try to uh, you know keep our contacts uh, alive. Many of them have now shifted out, but we can uh, still nurture their contacts, realistically speaking. But at the same time, we should not sigh of dealing with Taliban if it comes that way. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will now turn uh, back to Professor uh, Raja Mohan. I will ask you to just comment also on what, what Dr. Adil has asked. It was touched upon by Dr. Ashok earlier. Uh, the Taliban spokesman Sohail Shaheen is on record for welcoming the NSA's the seven nation con conference what would be the reason and i would like to add to that what do you think is taliban's view on their relations with india and then you could make your, your conclusion please look, uh, i think you know i, I briefly mentioned it earlier look taliban wants autonomy from pakistan right they want autonomy from pakistan they want to break the current isolation they are in which the us has locked their money uh, and I put them in some kind of an isolation. So they're looking for anyone who can play with them. The Chinese and Russians have responded the most. So they say India is around. So say nice things. So it's a probe. I mean, it's not that they promised us anything or we promised them anything at this point. We've given them the medical assistance. We want to send the food aid. So it is a probe. I mean, uh, why are we shocked by that? You know, so that is what they, what is Taliban's interest? That's why to focus on, you know, not on the framing of the last 20 years where we said Taliban is bad, there's no such thing as good Taliban, and it, you know, we were only back the Kabul elected government. That was the catechism of the last 20 years. There is a new facts, all states have to adapt to the new facts. So for us, the important thing, as I said, look, why is Taliban making the statements? Because they want a freedom of action. They want to stabilize themselves, and that's where they're trying to reach out to whoever they can, in whatever form they can, and saying, look, we're good boys, we'll be nice to you. Just help us out at this point of time. So, so it is a, uh, it is like they they attempt to two things: one to get more autonomy from Pakistan; second, to end their isolation. And they'll keep trying, and if India is begin to respond, small steps. But we're not talking about diplomatic recognition. We're not talking about formalization of the relationship. But if there's room to play, I think I'm sure Delhi will play. I mean, Delhi is not a some innocent uh, Snow White out there. So if there's room to engage them, I think Delhi too uh, will uh, will do that. Second, on the economic question that was raised, look, 
every single government in Kabul last 20 years, including Karzai and the successors, repeatedly went to Pakistan, China and said, we want your money, we want your infrastructure, please bring CPEC into India, uh, sorry, into Afghanistan, we want more roadways through Akan corridor, so please do what you're doing in Pakistan to us. Why, they do, why did they do it? So that is a structural interest of Kabul, not just of the Taliban. They want someone to put in the money to develop it. The question of terms, how do you negotiate it, is different. And for, for Karza, I saw it as a way of, again, getting some autonomy from Pakistan. That is, if China is on your side, it can give you some space. The Chinese can make Pakistan is behave. I mean, that's a hope. Uh, that you can get some leverage vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. If you had a good relationship with China, because for China, it is still a Pakistan first foreign policy. Uh, for them, the weight is on the Pakistan army. So how that plays out that remains to be seen. So I think we should not rule it out. Look, Chinese are not going to put money. As, as some of the panelists say, look, what does it take to put $100 million for the Chinese? Uh, which already existing CPEC infrastructure to move it a little bit into the other side, uh, it costs them nothing. The question is how it gets safeguarded, how it gets secured. Mm -hmm. Those are issues. But those, like if they can do it in Pakistan, Gwadar, you see the massive demonstration. After 20 years, and the women of Kodar have come out to protest against all kinds of things. So I think to say, look, either or, you know, you can't get into either or. They say, look, Chinese will make an effort. If they can buy Taliban's commitment to throw out the weaker uh, rebellion there, hand them over, uh, they will pay a price for that. They're willing to pay a price for that. Question is, uh, have those terms been settled or is it is it still uh, in place? So I think, so again, I think, let me conclude here by, by saying, Look, I think we should focus on the, the, the new dynamics that are shaping. And I would say, forget for a moment the last 20 years history and the slogans of the last 20 years. They had their time. Now the question is, there are new facts. The question is, we must begin to analyze the new facts, the new situation. And within that, what are the contradictions? What are the room for India, uh, Indian state uh, to engage and to gain some ground or to protect? If it is a purely defensive uh, venture too, we need to protect our interests from the worst possible outcomes in, in Afghanistan. So thank you very much. And I think uh, there's uh, barely any time left. Uh, I'll have to just conclude uh, this wonderful uh, conference. Uh, I think I, I will, I'll be speaking for everyone when I say that the deliberations over the past two days have provided all of us a much better understanding of the challenges which are facing a volatile and uncertain Afghanistan as well as a better grasp of the possible policy options that some of the stakeholders could take in this given situation. There are several important issues which have been flagged. I will not be able to cover all of them, but I would like to touch upon one or two. Uh, one of the speakers mentioned that it is too early to de-hyphenate the AFPAC. It still remains the cauldron of terrorism, the global epicenter of radical thought, the linkage of Taliban, with some of the other terrorist organizations are well known, it was felt that the compulsions of gun running as well as illegal trade in drugs could see new terrorist activities mushrooming, affecting not only the Indian subcontinent, but also the Central Asian republics extending to the Middle East and the world beyond. So in short, many of the core issues that plague the Afpak region and their wider implications remain significant even after the US exit. So it is not just the issue of Taliban in Afghanistan alone. It still remains a much wider issue. For Afghanistan per se, it has been very clear that the headline banner, as the DG said, is uncertainty. Also, the broad point has you know, been made that there's an increasing humanitarian crisis which is looming and it will only exacerbate as this winter which is upon us becomes more harsh. The challenge for the world is how to avert this humanitarian catastrophe by helping the Afghan people while trying to sanction and refusing to recognize the Taliban leadership. So I'm very grateful uh, to the panelists of this session. Uh, you all responded very fast as I, as I kept swinging the questions from one to the other. Uh, you all uh, uh, were uh, very lucid in your comments. I'd like to also congratulate the South Asia Center and the web team, particularly Mr. Vishal and Mr. Piyush uh, for anchoring this conference. And I would now like to hand over to Mr. to, uh, to uh, DMC. Yeah, Sindhu. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I would like to invite Mr. Vishal Chandra, the conference coordinator, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, sir.
uh, thank you, Sindhu. Uh, it gives me great uh, pleasure to be delivering uh, the vote of thanks this uh, evening. Uh, I would first of all like to thank uh, all the distinguished speakers, first and foremost, because uh, uh, they accepted our invitation uh, at a rather short, short notice and uh, they contributed to the discussion and uh, several of them have sent mails uh, sharing their experience uh, with me and uh, maybe in times to come out share with you all. Uh, thereafter, I would like to thank uh, Director General Ambassador Sujad Chunoy for his constant support and guidance and our Deputy Director General, Major General uh, Bipin Bakshi, uh, who, who, was, who, was, who was always there as and when we needed his guidance and support. And uh, well, it was a team effort, so I would like to thank some of my colleagues, uh, starting with uh, uh, Ms. Sindhu Dinesh, who accepted uh, my request to uh, anchor the proceedings of the conference at, again, at a very short notice. And uh, members of the repertoring team who have a very important role, uh, especially when the conference is over. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Priyanka Singh, uh, Dr. Manzoor Ahmed Bhatt, Dr. Gulbin Sultana, and Dr. Zainab Akhtar. And uh, well, since this organ this conference was organized online, fully online, I think this is the first major conference, a two-day international conference we did online so uh, it's been quite an experience for me and uh, for the uh, web technical team so i would like to thank uh, our webmaster uh, mr piyush kumar singh who made the uh, uh, virtually uh, you know helped us uh, organize this conference virtually so because he handled uh, this uh, you know the registration part sending the links and uh, uh, ensuring that the platform which we were using uh, worked efficiently. So thank you, uh, uh, Piyush and uh, Mukesh ji. And, and uh, thereafter, I would like to thank uh, uh, members of the tweeting team, uh, led by Dr. Smuti Patmaik and uh, Dr. Rajoshi Roy. I would like to thank Mr. Niranjan Chandrasekhar Oak, Mr. Akash Sahu, uh, Ms. Uh, Mayuri uh, Banerjee. Uh, our conference then again played a very important role uh, Ms. Amita Naran, who was responsible for constantly uh, sending out mails to the participants, to the members of, uh, uh, of our institute, to the scholars, to the interns, and uh, to Ms. Aparna Krishna for uh, uh, issuing press release uh, in time, and uh, uh, the assistant director administration for the backup that he provided uh, for this uh, conference. And uh, well, I also need to thank uh, the chairpersons for all the four sessions. Of course, two sessions were chaired, one and a half, I must say, by Director General and uh, Deputy Director General. Uh, so I would like to thank Ambassador Ashok Sajjanhar and Ambassador Rakesh uh, Sood again for accepting our request to chair two of the sessions uh, uh, you know, at a very short notice again. So, uh, thank you all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and um, uh, now comes the uh, second part of the co organizing of conference, which is uh, getting papers from all the speakers. So, we have the panelists of the fourth session here, so I, I can request them directly online. Uh, well, I'll be in touch with you next few days, uh, and uh, we'll give sufficient time to each one of you. and to write your papers and if possible, if you could take time out of your busy schedule to write a short paper for us. So uh, with the, on that note, sir, thank you uh, for uh, chairing the concluding session and thank you all uh, for um, helping me in organizing this conference, putting this conference together. The credit goes to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Uh, many thanks to you two for bringing together and organizing this really important conference. Wishing you all the very best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice. Great being with all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye.